the cilia trunk and both kidneys. And um, also the time, the operation time is, uh, in this case, for example, it's uh, just uh, 94 minutes. And in emergency case, you is, you are really fast. So this is a case of emergency, if by fourth rock abdominal aneurysm, and uh, we did the operation, and you can see here the left kidney and the cilia trunk, and we can see the time we needed to implant all this prothesis, and it was just 80 minutes. We had to implant also a uh, ever, so it's 80 minutes for everything. It's really fast. This was the result, and there are some examples of uh, the uh, uh, eye beaver. And here also you can see it's five branches. There is a branch for the inferior uh, mesenterical artery with very long branch coming of the prothesis. Um, this is other examples, and uh, this is, a, for example, a patient with uh, three vessels, and we did 28 patients, um, and we have a, a branch per patient four. And uh, you can see here, we have a paraplegia of one person, just one patient and four persons. And uh, the 30 days intervention, also one patient and the 30 days mortality, two patients. We published it in Endovascular Today, and we are the center of excellence in the treatment of this kind of operation in Germany. The eye beaver is feasible and, uh, in the treatment of thoracoabdominal aneurysm and extrarenal aneurysm. The eye beaver offers solution in complicated cases and the development of, of the shelf uh, uh, prothesis is very important in emergency cases. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be ready to answer all of your questions. Thank you very, very much. Right. Um, is, is, is Dr. Ahmed online to ask questions, or no, he's not? Okay. Um, maybe David, do you want to comment on this um, new exciting IB bar? Yes, I've used it. It's um, uh, very straightforward to use. In fact, I would say possibly easier than doing a fenestrated graft uh, and uh, very useful the fact that it's off the shelf and compatible with almost all anatomies but not quite all so do you think it's a game changer then um, in the in the urgent setting because i mean um for example in saudi arabia the, the time it takes us to get a fever done sam is what 12 weeks yeah at least 12 weeks. So uh, do, you, do you think it's something we should be looking at? Um, well, I, I think it's usefulness. Well, you can obviously use it in elective cases, but um, for me, it's usefulness. The, one of the problems with it is it's got a very long um, sort of proximal segment, and I think it's designed to be used as in a thoracoabdominal rather, or completion of a thoracoabdominal rather than just on its own. Uh, and I've used it twice, and one of the cases became uh, paraplegic, and I'm sure it's to do with the long thoracic segment. So I think it's, if you can wait, you're probably better with a custom-made device, uh, which is as short as possible. But uh, if you can't wait, then you need to keep it in the hospital for emergency cases rather than or having to order it in. Anybody from the floor want to ask any questions on this or comments? OK. Um, let's move on so we don't eat too much into your lunch break. Um, our next speaker is Nasser Said, who's going to be presenting TVAR using uh, carotid, it says by carotid to carotid subclavian bypass, retropharyngeal approach. Um, I'm assuming it's with rather than by, but we'll find out in a minute. Actually, I am a great honor to be with you today to present a very interesting and funny case. Actually, we'll start with a funny scenario. Uh, my patient is a 62 years old lady, diabetic hypertensive. The story started several weeks ago. Firstly, the patient went to a military hospital, Cairo with a vague symptom. Heart paired interscapular pain, severe progressing dysphagia, which were misleading the doctor over there, so they began to search for GIT causes. Uh, start to investigate the patient, full lab done, CT with oral contrast, 
which revealed a mass compressing esophagus. Then our endoscopy, esophageal endoscopy was done, taken biopsy, and actually I don't know why they insist to take a biopsy from this mass before making sure what is the nature of this mass, and this is the main problem in the scenario. Unfortunately, the patient deteriorated quickly after taking the biopsy, documented by sequential CBC revealed rapid hemoglobin drop. CT angio, it was mandatory in that case, revealed enlarged mass compressing the esophagus, and the bi 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 uh, biopsy revealed uh, normal esophageal epithelium, nothing specific. Uh, because of rapid deterioration of the patient, they decided to inform the same and they send the patient to us because uh, uh, doctors look after this patient was a general surgeon or GIT surgeon. Uh, while the patient in his way to our center, they sent everything about the patient, uh, all investigation to us, and we studied this uh, investigation, especially the CT angio, which uh, assures there is a dissecting aortic aneurysm type two. Uh, this is a sagittal view. Here we are. This is the mass compressing the adoxal, and this is the uh, sagittal diagram. Different view. Uh, so we realize that there is a type two dissection uh, just uh, adjacent to the left subclavian, and unfortunately, by our measurement, the, the distance between left subclavian and the carotid was too short. So we measuring the landing zone. We decided to do a T var for this patient. But the, the landing zone to be two centimeter, we should be near by the uh, brachiocephalic. So this is different view for measurement. Uh, this is the distal landing zone wasn't a problem. Uh, we have a nice aorta, sobraciliac. So patient referred to us after suspecting leaking thoracic aortic aneurysm. Uh, over there. Uh, on arrival, uh, the case was studied carefully and the decision was taken quickly to prepare the patient for DVAR with partial debranching. All obstacles, preoperative, we tried hard to uh, get rid of the obstacle as soon as possible. Uh, then, this is a measure of our device suitable. I just remind you you with the zone of the aortic arch. So in this case, we target zone one. So our option to solve this problem, uh, to try to do carotid, carotid crossover by bus, uh, and carotid subclavian, a retropharyngeal approach will be referred for many reasons, or doing axillary, axillary, or subclavian subclavian was jump graft to the carotid. Actually, we prefer carotid, carotid, uh, because it's a short track. Uh, this is, sorry, uh, this is the fair, uh, position of the patient. Sorry, we, one minute. I have two minutes. This is a final presentation. So quickly, this is the right carotid, left carotid. We done uh, the bypass uh, retropharyngeal. It wasn't difficult to go through the retropharyngeal approach because this is a potential space. Uh, we finished the carotid, carotid uh, bypass. Then uh, we expose the subclavian. Here it is, this is a carotid step. Then the subclavian. We finish the uh, closing the patient. This is an incision. Going through the groin, as you see, you can see the graft 
carotid, carotid, and subclavian. Sorry for the shortening of time. Uh, marking the exact site of deployment. Here it is. Uh, right, this is a. Uh, so my message in that case, um, the problem was uh, the GIT surgeon who decided to take a biopsy without uh, assuring what uh, nature of the mass make a complication seriously. And our uh, message also, carotid, carotid, subclavian, retropharyngeal approach, uh, it's quite nice and uh, easy procedures with success rate. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating case. Thank you, Victor. Um, I open the floor for questions or comments. Any questions or comments? Professor Ali Bello. So The mic is on. Do you have any experience with homemade fenestration for the arch? Experience of what? For homemade fenestration of the graft. No, unfortunately, it's, no. It's we more, don't, it's more not easy available. than uh, carotid or carotid uh, bypass. I agree with you, but I haven't experienced. But I think in carotid, carotid bypass retropharyngeal uh, may work well with good patency rate. I know the long-term patency rate of carotid, carotid bypass in EVAR. Uh, we don't have a long-term result, but depending on this, in the setting of occlusive disease, it does work well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, our next speaker um, is, I believe, Dr. Mohammed Al Shawal who's going to present uh, PMEG for emergency complex uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Mohammed. Mohammed is one of the uh, promising young surgeons from Egypt working in Brighton. Thank you. With our friends uh, Mario Caruana. And I'm delighted to see him up here on the stage. Thank you. Will do. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll be very briefly discussing physician-modified endografts for emergency complex AAA repairs. As a quick background, over the past couple of decades, there have been significant improvements in endograft uh, designs, and, and with the constant evolution, EVAR has become the preferentially uh, used treatment for these uh, complex treatments. It's a bit more complex than that with uh, the more extensive aneurysm types, and that's because in the elective setting, we would usually elect to use a custom-made device, which carries significant risk as well as a very long uh, production time of about at least six to eight weeks. So these are not feasible in the emergency setting. Now in terms of options for an emergency presentation, there are some off-shelf devices such as the T-branch, Tambi device, inner branch devices. There's the other option of using in situ laser fenestration, which has been successfully used in the aortic arch and has now started to be used in the visceral segment as well. And there is the option of physician-modified endografts. So our first case was a 76-year-old gentleman with a complex medical history of ischemic heart disease, interstitial lung disease, who had a type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair in 2009 and was discovered on follow-up to have an 8.5 centimeter paraanastomotic aneurysm. He was being planned electively for a custom-made three-branch device, but unfortunately depended in the interim with this CT scan showing a frank rupture uh, of his abdominal aortic aneurysm or his thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Now, in terms of options, we had recently used our on-shelf T branch, so that was not uh, available. He was not a candidate for a redo open thoracoabdominal repair, and so we decided to proceed with a physician-modified graft. The main steps, and this is the most important step, which is the planning uh, using a 3D reconstruction system to ensure a two centimeter proximal sealing zone and to accurately allocate the distance of the fenestrations from the top of the graft as well as the clock face. We elected to use the Cook TX2 platform and bridge the, uh, the fenestrations with the Bentley B plus grafts. Here we can see the next step which is deploying the stent onto the back table, marking and creating the fenestrations using ophthalmic cautery 
and then we have to reinforce these fenestrations. Uh, we usually use the limbs of an end snare, and we use gold markers uh, around the sides as well. Then comes the step of recompressing and resheathing the graft in preparation for transfemoral implantation. We preferentially use the groin access uh, to do the cannulation and stenting of all the visceral vessels, and here we can see the SMA, celiac, and, both, and the right renal artery. In this case, the left renal artery uh, was not needed because he had an atrophic left kidney. The completion angiogram showed a successful, uh, satisfactory appearance, but this patient had a stormy post-op course uh, with a chest infection and was discharged on day 19. He did, however, readmit uh, three months later with a type 3 endoleak between the two stents in his right renal artery and unfortunately uh, caught COVID and succumbed to the respiratory infection. The second case, very briefly, was an 84-year-old gentleman with, again, a complex background, medical history, who had a previous EVAR and presented with abdominal pain and a symptomatic aneurysm in the context of a type 1A endoleak as well as a break in the calcium of the anterior wall of his aneurysm. So again, there was no time to wait for a custom-made device, so we elected to proceed with a cuff extension using a three-fenestration PMEG. This time we used the Zenith Flex device, and we used uh, Bentley stents as well for the bridging. Again, we can see the marking and creation of the fenestrations. In this case, there is a particular challenge because in the SMA uh, fenestration, there was a strut directly in the middle, so we had to reposition that strut to enable cannulation and stenting of that fenestration. Then we proceed to placing the gold markers and then constricting and deploying the graft. And here we can see the cannulated three vessels as well as successful completion angiogram showing no endo leaks as well as patent visceral vessels. This patient had a post-operative uh, smooth course and was discharged home day four post-op. So in conclusion, physician-modified endografts are a viable option in the emergency setting. They do, however, require a variety of on-shelf equipment and you can't afford to take shortcuts as they require very careful planning, measure twice and cut once, and they do require a close post-operative follow-up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mohamed. Um, any comments from here? Yeah, um, yeah very interesting. Um, do you do any sort of mechanism where you partially deploy or you fully deploy the stent or the stent graft before you, before you fenestrate? On the back table, you mean? Yeah. Yes, so we usually partially deploy the graft. We have fully deployed it because we tend to use the peel-away sheath uh, for reintroduction, so we tend to pull the, the stent backwards rather than push it forwards. Sorry, I mean in the body. So oh, in I the body. Seen some, I've never done it myself, but I've seen some people write up that they um, they put some sutures on the back of the graft to do a sort of partial deployment, yep. and then somehow it's obviously surgical magic. You can pull some suture and undoes them all. We don't we don't routinely use diameter reducing ties for them, so we fully That's deploy. Yeah. So we fully deploy them and cannulate through the deployment. And, and that doesn't seem to cause a problem with accuracy of positioning? We tend to use fusion imaging as well as uh, the angiograms to try and get the best uh, allocation. Well done. Thank you. Mike is up. Uh, during deployment of the physician modified, what is the, the, uh, the beginning of this EMEO or celiac with the uh, uh, position of uh, the, the arteries? It, it is one is lateral and the other is a posterior fold. The orientation, you, you begin with this EMEO or the celiac artery, is a difficult in uh, deployment of the graft. So we usually start with the SMA because that is the only vessel that we cannot sacrifice. Uh, so we position the whole graft based on the SMA fenestration. Uh, and then we aim to, to think that if, if the planning was correct, that the rest of the fenestrations will lie in place. Uh, so we start by targeting the SMA, deploy the graft and stent the SMA. And then following that, we can start uh, stenting the renals. Uh, also for the uh, repositioning of the graft uh, your after fenestration, what's the tips and the tricks for the delivery of the system again? 
Yes. So th I think that's the most tricky segment of, of physician-modified grafts. And, and that's mainly because of the top stent or the top cap, which has barbs. Because when you deploy the stent on the back table, once you try to resheath it, that area tends to catch uh, on the back. So if you can manage to keep that segment still inside the sheath, that makes everything easier. We tend to use number one uh, nylon or, or proline stitches to constrain every stent separately and that makes it easier to, to resheath the whole stent. Some people have used uh, nylon tape or um, sort of vessel loops to wrap around the whole stent as a single step rather than multiple different segments. And last, Professor Majdi. Uh, I want to ask about the, the size of the frustrations you, you do depend on the size of the graft you're going to use, or you fix it to six millimeter for the renals and eight full, uh, millimeters for the celiac and uh, SMA. And the second point, do you face any problems during the flaring, or you don't do flaring at all? Uh, thank you, Professor Magdi. We, we usually try to keep them standardized, so we use six millimeter fenestrations approximately for the renals around eight millimeters for the SMA. We've sometimes made them 10 millimeters if it's a larger vessel. Uh, and that's because all the, the balloon expandable stem grafts can take some post dilatation and can enlarge a bit. In terms of the, um, in terms of the flaring, I think that's our main worry or our main concern that our fenestrations and our rings may not be strong enough to withhandle uh, the stress, but we still do uh, flare them. And thankfully we haven't had any issues with that. Right. Um, Thank you. Thanks very much. One quick question. I'm just trying to think, how, how long does it take you to do this? I'm just thinking in a rupture scenario with a patient with a thoraco, rupture thoraco abdominal, and you're sitting there fiddling on the table, putting holes in a graft. So usually each fenestration takes about 10 minutes. So we utilize the time for the patient coming from the emergency department in the anesthetic room for a team to start doing that. And the second team does the bilateral cut downs due to the sheath exchange. So we usually use cut downs for these for these procedures. Uh, yeah, hello, very good. Um, so Birmingham, we do a lot of surgical modified grafts, and the rule is that the patient has to survive a transfer in the daylight hours, so it's not done at night time. If they ruptured, they stay in their base hospital, and then if they're fine by the morning, then they get transferred over to be done during the daylight hours. Oh, the Edinburgh model always works. <laughs> Makes your results look well. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mohammed. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, um, there's a slight change to the um, uh, the timetable. Uh, we've got Dr. Sambert again, this time talking about hybrid repair of thracobdominal aneurysms with total infrarenal aortic occlusion, de nouveau techniques. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> yeah, I'm going to prevent another also complicated cases uh, we faced. Patients 32 years old may refer to us with a large thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm type 3, severe leg pain and back pain also, but medical is significant for severe COPD. So the main issue he has severe COPD and his home oxygen. He has a stroke with myotride, hemoparesis, and slurred speech, hypertension, diabetes, and epilepsy. This is a CT angiogram. So he has a type 3 thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm, but the problem is the infrarenal aorta com component of the aneurysm is completely thrombosed. Also, the rear left renal artery is occluded with atrophic left kidney. He has a stenosis in the celiac artery, right ear artery stenosis, and normal creatinine. This is here, you can see this is a thoracic aorta, you can see celiac aorta, you can see dilated. And you can see here stenosis in the right renal artery and thrombosis in the infrarenal aorta. This is also, you can do 3D construction, complete thrombosis in infrarenal aorta with a thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm, and this is also 3D reconstruction. So what should we do, BVAR and TVAR? Of course, it can be done. There's no infra aorta to, to get there. The same for SHIVAR. Open repair was a good option. So again, of course, I think the first option. But again, based on severe COBD, we thought if we opened the chest, you know, we did a pulmonary test and it was really bad. So we decided to do what called modified hybrid repair. So what was our idea? The idea is that we can do a aortobifem 
and avoid the open the chest and the chest part we do it with the evar and tivar. The only problem I have is that I have no place to put an aortic clamp because of thoracoabdominal aneurysm. So the idea is that we said, well, let's switch our aorto bifem bypass to the aneurysm wall and uh, open the aneurysm. Aneurysm already thrombosed, so don't have to clamp. And after I switched the aorto bifem to the aneurysm itself, then I did a thrombectomy from the limb of the aorto bifem, and then I have an access to the thoracic aorta. And then from my aorto bifem bypass, I took a bypass, debranched the right renal, because the renal already thrombosed, and bypassed the celiac and SMA. And after I did the bypass, then through the other limb, I went there and put a T-var. So this way I exclude the aneurysms, and then I finish it by suturing the both limb to the both common femoral artery. This is during the procedure, this is the aneurysm, you can see it here. This is here, you can see we suture the aorta by film to the sac, the infrarenal aorta, which is already thrombose, then did thrombectomy, then I did, took my reverse aorta by film, I did bypass, this is going to the right renal, this is going side to side to SMA, and going all the way to the celiac artery, and this is the bypass to the SMA and right renal artery. And then after I did that, then through the aorto bifem graft, the main one, I put the T-var in the thoracic part. So this way we avoid to open the chest. This is during the surgery after we deployed the T-var. You can see complete exclusion of the aneurysm. And here you can see the patent of our bypasses. This is going to the SMA and the celiac artery. This is our first limb and the second limb of reversed uh, aorto bifem going to the right renal artery. Post operative patient did fine, kidney function was normal, uh, no stroke, and no paraplegia. And this is follow up CT scan. You can see complete exclusion of the aneurysm with the patent bypass to the celiac SMA and renal artery. So, what we think is that this kind of modified habit repair is a potential alternative to open repair, especially in high risk patients with extensive infrarenal aortic thrombosis. The advantage no need to open the chest if patient has like a severe COPD or lung issues and there's no aortic clamping, but of course the long-term durability of this kind of repair need to be validated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, any questions from the floor? I, I've got a question. I think when you say high risk, um, he, he survived your major abdominal retroperitoneal. This is all retroperitoneal, I, pre I presume, is that right? Uh, yes, uh, but we, we didn't open the chest. Yeah, I mean, he was not high risk. He was severe COBD already. It's not like high risk by definition of high risk. He has severe COBD and home oxygen. So the whole, whole idea is really just to open the chest. This is the whole idea. But this is an old case. I think these days, if he can't rate open repair, most of the open repair will go with that. But at least it's an option if you don't have to open the chest. Thank you, Dr. Sam, for this challenging and the very nice message. I just, uh, I wonder, uh, the patient presented to you with acute thrombosis of the infrarenal aortic aneurysm or presented by the thoracic aneurysm as a routine follow-up? No, he presents with a thrombosis, chronic thrombosis because he has no claudication. So this is an old thrombosis. So, so it's not acute? No, no, no. I can get it from your presentation, I'm sorry. No, no, it's not so, an acute, it's a chronic right. occlusion. So what you are going to do if this patient presented with acute thrombosis of infrarenal aneurysm and uh, threatened limb, how can you manage a case like this? I will make myself clear. If the patient presented to me with acute ischemia of post lower limb, when we are doing the work up, we find we found the, uh, acute thrombosis of infrarenal aortic aneurysm, and at the same time has a thoracic aneurysm. How I can manage this patient urgently or emergently? I think emergently you, you have, have the, the luxury to to do what you have done already. I know this is a nice yeah. and a very good technique. I think what you need to do though, at this point is just to salvage his legs. So if he comes acute ischemia, I will do open thrombectomy first and get the flow to the legs, you know? 
And o then open, open. Yes, from open. Back to me. Yes, from the groin. Or yes, from both the groin. Open from back to me. Get the flow bow down to the legs. You know. I, I think to, to to do open from from back to me for acute thrombosis aortic aneurysm is not our uh, usually or uh, working. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, but if I mean, yes, if you can do throat abdominal, of I, course. I mean. Not successfully, you can clear the aneurysm completely and restore the blood. I mean, in this case, if it's an acute, maybe you do. A, if you cannot do thrombectomy, do axillo by FM. I just get the patient off the table now. I mean, if, of course, I mean, if you have a center where you can do open thrombocytopenia, I mean, you can do thrombocytopenia. But again, need preparation. This is an acute thrombosis, and patient acute ischemia. So I think if patient present to me with acute ischemia, I open both the groin. If I can open thrombectomy, then I'm done. If it's not, then the same groin I use, I do axillo by FM for now, and then I'll worry about the thrombocytopenia aneurysm later on. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyhow, uh, I, I just seen uh, one case acute thrombosis aortic. Infra renal aortic aneurysm is uncommon, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Nasser. Um, just no, 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 come back, come back, come back. <laughs> what would you do? Um, I mean, I've seen a case which I've published many years ago in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery of a thrombosis of an inflammatory abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, and uh, I was going to ask Samir, what was the size of the abdominal aneurysm? Do you know? The size yeah, the is size. about six, but so I mean the thoracobdominal is about eight, but yeah, so, so the, the infrarenal aorta about six. The abdominal was was big then; it was six centimeters. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, ours was small; it was four point five centimeters. So, so I mean, what I did is I did an extra anatomical, right, to get the patient off the table, um, because his was inflammatory. Um, we and it was small; we didn't treat it um, with surgery. And we gave steroids, um, and things got better. And then we right. thought, okay, well, the aneurysm's thrombosed. Let's stop the steroids. Uh, and then the retroperitoneal fibrosis came back. But what what would you do in that situation? Um, what what would you do if you had a an abdominal aortic aneurysm that thrombosed? The patient come in with acute limb ischemia. Usually, it's not that severe. It, it, Actually, I, I remember one case. Was the patient uh, presented to us with acute ischemia of both lower limb. We diagnosed the patient at that time as a saddle embolus. Uh, and uh, when we start to do thrombectomy or emblectomy through the transfemoral bilaterally, uh, the material coming out uh, make me worry because this is not usual in the acute ischemia or saddle embolus. So we start to think this may be uh, thrombosis the aortic aneurysm because you 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 know that the, the thrombus inside the aorta usually is a mural thrombus so you can get rid of the recent thrombus and at the same time you can get uh, also an old thrombus this is make me think in thrombosis and when diagnosed as a thrombosis acute aortic aneurysm I shift to axillo by femoral. I agree with you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Great case. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Um, uh, we have the last speaker of the session. Uh, we moved that around. Um, and I think... Sorry, I'm lost now. We, we were supposed to have the role of the transthoracic echocardiogram as next. Um, is that right? Dr. Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed Said, ready? Yeah. So Dr. Ahmed is going to present, so we have two speakers. We have Dr. Ahmed Said is going to present the role of T in thoracic dissecting aortic aneurysms uh, uh, with difficult cannulation of the true lumen. And then our final speaker of the session will be Alak Tawari next to me here, who's going to talk about double aortic aneurysm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, going to present maybe uh, a much easier case than the previous ones, but uh, just to show you the importance of uh, imaging during uh, performing procedures like aortic dissections. Uh, this was a 45-year-old male, hypertensive, non-diabetic, presenting with uh, back pain, and uh, his CT showed uh, this uh, type B aortic dissection, um, which causes um, a big aneurysm of the false lumen reaching 78 millimeters. The main tear was located in the zone 3, just after the left subclavian, and you can notice that it's compressing the true lumen, making it slit-like. 
Uh, two challenges uh, are here. First one, no adequate proximal sealing zone, so we perform the carotid subclavian bypass. And the second challenge is the cannulation of the true lumen upwards. Um, a primary plan was uh, right brachial access, passage in the true lumen and the snaring from the groin, followed by upward passage of the catheter and the further tools to cannulate. But unfortunately, every time we do this, we got uh, in the false lumen. So we decided to use the TEE. On the left side, you, you notice that the wire is passing in the aneurysm sac. And when you look in the images of the TEE, you can notice Notice that the wire eventually passes into the big cavity, uh, both true and false human together. So um, guidance with the TEE could help you to um, to see where is the wire exactly. Here it's just before entering into the distal, uh, into the uh, aneurysmal sac, and. By seeing these views, you can try gently to manipulate your wire one by one until you get it outside the false lumen and then get it back into the true lumen. Uh, lo looking here, first you believe you are in the false lumen, but the TE tells you no, it's not, so you pull it back again and then re-push again until you finally reach your uh, true lumen. Um, if we look here, this is an aortic long axis, and uh, I don't know, it's not running, but anyway, this is a very narrow true lumen. Uh, it was narrow to the extent that we needed to balloon dilate it. Uh, and you can see the, the tight lesion here in order to allow our tools to pass to this uh, lumen. Eventually now we have a, a bigger true lumen and the wire here is passing inside it and it's now clearer. The wire is passing into the true lumen proximally until eventually we got into the aortic valve. Looking to this on, on fluoroscopy, now you can see the wire passing down into the uh, uh, aortic uh, ascending aort. Um, for precise uh, deployment, we needed to see by the TE the exact location, just distal to the left common carotid artery. You can notice the bypass here patent. And at the end, these are the final uh, images, and even the abdominal part is quite good. Um, the TE can also be used to uh, control the post-deployment and see uh, the patency as well as exclude any endoleak here. Moreover, interestingly, after just 20 minutes, we started to notice thrombosis of the false lumen here, another advantage. So my take-home message is that imaging is recommended for aortic dissections, I mean intravascular imaging. We need to get familiar with the images to get the most benefit. Uh, several uh, papers have uh, compared the use of IVUS and TE. Uh, I will show you here one of the IVUS cases we performed uh, last year, and um, it gives you quite nice images. This is in the abdominal aorta, actually. You can notice first the, the celiac trunk, And then the SMA. And then this is the left renal vein, and after that, both renal arteries emerge here. So they, they are quite nice images, uh, which makes you think of both the modalities. Uh, both of them have their advantages. TEE is actually advantageous in uh, precise deployment and better in excluding endoleaks. It's cheaper and readily, readily available in most hospitals. On the other hand, the IVUS is, uh, uh, can see the abdominal segment, which the TEE cannot do. It's user-friendly because you do it yourself. You are the operator. You don't depend on someone else who is steering the, 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 the image. And um, uh, it's proper, it's better in proper sizing of the grafts. Thank you.
Thank you, Tugram. A very elegant presentation. Uh, I'll take two questions. Simon? Uh, Ahmed, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, actually, the transvaginal echocardiography is very useful and beneficial in uh, navigating and steering your wire, uh, especially at the uh, thoracic segment of the dissection. However, in a quite good number of patients, you, uh, you have tears in the abdominal segment of the aorta and even uh, at the, uh, at the, very close to the side of your axis. Uh, might be even at the site of the iliac artery. So at that, uh, at these points, you cannot, of course, you would be transvaginal echo in order to detect. You can detect that your wire is uh, out of your uh, uh, way, I mean in the false lumen rather than the true lumen, but you can't navigate uh, the wire into the true lumen by using it. So in, in this particular uh, uh, occasion, you might use the, uh, as you said, I the IVAS, or sometimes we utilize, I don't know, I, uh, this is my question now, your opinion of having a long sheath and pushing a die from above down until you find the tear and at that side you can navigate your wire at the side of tear. I mean, uh, with, the, with the contrast rather than with uh, ultrasound. Thank you. Of course, you might uh, use the angiography to guide it, but uh, getting back to the literature, IVUS and TEE are more accurate. So, um, yes, we can do it, but it's more a lengthy procedure, more contrast, and sometimes we cannot afford it. We, we, we are not successful to do it. So, uh, I believe instead of multiple trials, more use of dye, it's shorter to use uh, one of these images if they're available. Thank you for the presentation. I agree with you that T and uh, IVAS is an excellent tool to know where you're going, and we have them both. We used to use them a lot, but now we really we use them really. The reason what happened is just we use a different technique. We just go at the distal aorta, we do a big tail. With the big tail form, we just push the big tail without wire. Because if you put a wire, wire is going to go in and out. If you form the big tail, I just push the big tail blindly without a wire. 95% you are in the true domain. And we, when we start doing this technique, really, really we have to use an IVAS or TE. I don't know if you use this technique or anybody has different technique. We're getting some knots here. Um, yeah, all uh, the time. And I know, I know that my colleagues Tanya and others use the pigtail, soft entry as she calls it. Yeah. Dr. Hussam, uh, I'm yeah. going to make an exception to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Hussam, not Birmingham. Uh, I, well, so I just killed one of my points is that I was going to say that you use a pigtail and that usually guarantees, but uh, ent entering to the true limit. However, if you struggle, we always, if you come from the top into the, from the subclavian, and then snare it from the bottom, that almost always guarantees that you're in true lumen. And we've used, we use that very often, is that if we struggle to- uh, Actually, this is what happened, yes. We usually sure. from the top, and that usually solves the problem. Thank you. Yes, sure, and this is what really happened. So it, it, we, we believe that it's, it's going to be easy to go from up down, but uh, eventually this, this was the case. It wasn't easy as we thought. Even coming from the top? Even? Even coming from the top? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry that I'm running the slides very quickly, but one of the slides was showing the catheter from the top and passing to the abdominal segment, and there we found ourselves in the false lumen. I'm not, I don't know when, when did this actually happen, but eventually we could not manage to go through it until the end. Thanks, thanks very much. I'm sure it's a great discussion which we should probably carry on afterwards that time is of the essence. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague to my left here, uh, Mr. Alok Tiwari, who is a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon in Birmingham. Um, he worked in the same hospital uh, I trained in, uh, so um, I'm a bit biased. <laughs> Go ahead, Alok. Thanks very much. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Alexander Vasco Conference for inviting me. Um, and secondly, uh, I won't be showing you any wires, so uh, I'm going to pretend to be an old-fashioned surgeon today. So, um, Friday afternoon uh, in Birmingham, um, usually when the weekend starts, so everyone's getting ready to go, I was referred a 51-year-old female uh, with a background of Bechet's, who also had a renal transplant. Um, 
She'd been known to have an abdominal aortic aneurysm in surveillance at a, another hospital, and she was referred because they said, oh, well, her four centimeter aneurysm is now six centimeters. And then you go back and you look at the records for the last year or two, and they seem to be different sizes every time. So couldn't quite work out what was going on. Anyway, we did a CT scan. You have it, love it. Um, so the CT scan, I don't know whether you can see it, it shows that she actually has two aneurysms. <laughs> And my guess is that whoever had been scanning her, they were scanning one or the other aneurysm, but never both. Um, so what it shows is that she has a six centimeter renal artery aneurysm, and probably about a four, four and a half centimeter aortic aneurysm, and you can see the transplanted kidney. So what do we do about this? Um, so you do what you do in the UK, you take it to the multidisciplinary team meeting. And we discussed for half an hour, and um, the questions were, do you do anything endovascular, or do you do open surgery? And the conclusion was, we will support you, whatever you like to do, but no one actually gave any answers on what you should do really about it. Um, so in view of her age, she was only 51, we decided to go for some form of open surgery. And when I went to consent her saying, we're probably going to do an open operation, there is a small chance of uh, losing your transplanted kidney, she burst into tears. Which is understandable, except then I found out that the kidney was actually donated to her by her husband. So the pressure was really on now to try and salvage the kidney and repair the aneurysm. So the first thing uh, I decided to do was to do an axillary unifem bypass graft. So whatever clamping I did, the kidney would be uh, perfused. And I was actually lucky that the uh, axillary artery and the femoral artery were actually quite soft. Um, exposed the uh, suprarenal uh, aorta with a view to clamping it and then decided that I was going to try and put some kind of a bifurcated graft and I wanted to clamp the um, iliac arteries to find out that the iliac arteries were non-compressible. There was no way that I could actually uh, clamp these arteries. They were so calcified. So what do we do now? Um, we've got the patient open. We've done all the exposure. So somehow the other, I managed to find one little bit of soft distal aorta where I could put a clamp on um, and managed to do a straight graft ligating the renal artery aneurysm and uh, basically doing an aortic, aortic bypass graft rather than a, uh, a bifurcated graft. Because I was happy with the operation, we ligated the axilla unibirth foam graft straight away, mainly because this lady was on immunosuppressants. And I was slightly concerned about doing, leaving an extra anatomical graft which might get infected. And uh, she went to ITU. So what are the take home messages? Um, you can discuss complex cases at the MDT, but actually at the end of the day, it's your patient and you have to make your decisions on what you think that is the best for your patient. If you're going to do a complex case, find another surgeon who thinks like you. So I used another colleague, uh, a more experienced vascular surgeon, an open vascular surgeon compared to me. Think about uh, what you need to preserve and what are you trying to um, outcome wise. And for this lady, her most important thing, apart from staying alive, was that her husband's transplanted kidney uh, was still patent. And then think about if you get a very calcified and non-clampable arteries, what do you do? We got lucky, but you could have had other strategies for this. Thank you very much. Right, um, thanks for that, Alec. Interesting case. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? Simon. Somebody turn uh, Dr. Casale's mic on for him. That was working. Yeah. 
Uh, did you think to use an ECMO with a venous arterial venous uh, bypass instead of doing axillo fem with an ECMO machine? Um, you can you save yourself a bypass. Okay, I want uh, I don't have any experience of that, but yes, that that's a good suggestion. Yeah, if you have a cardiac team and good, this would be better. You know, it'd be easier for you. Thanks. Yep. I have a question, Alok. Um, I may have missed it, um, but we're worried about a native renal artery aneurysm, not a transplant renal artery aneurysm. No, it was an, it was an interesting. It was the non-functioning native kidney had developed a six centimeter renal artery aneurysm. Okay. Um, there is a sting in the tail, which is quite fascinating, was four years later, the patient died of a renal tumor in the, art, in the kidney that I'd ligated which was non-functioning. Um, no, no idea how that could have happened. That's coincidental, yeah. Um, right. I mean, it's interesting, Simon, the AXFEM technique um, was developed by Anthony Camarotta back in the early 90s um, for the thoracic abdominals in the days when we used to clamp and sew like hell. And he came up with that idea, um, the heparin bonded, you know, 10 millimeter out, outside, just to do the operation. But I think you're right, it has been su superseded now by, um, by the femoral, femoral shunting. I think, um, well, one of your uh, consultant colleagues, Simon Smith, used to do it for people with probably a bit of heart failure or eject low ejection fraction. He would do a, an extra anatomical bypass to reduce the afterload. That's right, we, we started doing it at that time when, when I was a senior mm -hmm. age after we'd seen Antti Camerota presented here. There you go. Right. Um, any further questions before we end this session? I'd, I'd like to thank all the speakers for some great cases. Um, I, I think the theme of this whole conference is friends, challenging difficult, uh, presenting difficult cases, learning from each other, and drogogy as we like to call it. Um, uh, we have a session here for the Allied Health Professionals um, Orthopedic Symposium. Please support that next, um, and we'll have a, a little break for the rest of us uh, for lunch. We've lost about an hour, um, as they say, crossing the Atlantic. So, if we could ask that speakers in the next session to do their utmost best to to try to keep the time. Thank you very much. start the orthomedics uh, symposium uh, now introduce uh, professor dr khaled deep uh, and his team uh, to discuss uh, the new era of uh, uh, processes uh, in orthomedics companies thanks Th thank you dr Hain. thank you dr Hain. Uh, orthomedics started in 1992 with the clear vision uh, helping people to overcome disabilities and the clear vision mission by providing high-end product and service. Now orthomedics is considered the largest company working in the field of orthotics and prosthetics in Middle East. What we do, we cover product, service, and industrial. Products, we cover prosthetics, human mobility orthotics. For service, we have 11 patient care, which cover most of Egyptian uh, population. Also, we cover an exoskeleton uh, products. Uh, Orthomedics have uh, workshops, largest workshops in the Middle East with a high up-to-date technology uh, in machines. We have 11 clinics which cover Cairo, Alexandria, Mansoura, Ismailia, Zagazig. We have all the certificates that allowed us to export our product outside Egypt. 
We export our product to more than 15 uh, countries. We represent many international companies in Egypt, about 25 uh, companies. The most famous one are Autobock, Wagner, Streifenhuber from Germany. Our subject today is about the orthotic management of the neuropathic foot. Uh, diabetic foot ulcer are responsible for 85% of the lower extremity amputation. From 80 to 85 of all amputation caused by diabetes are preventable. How to avoid amputation? Work team. دي اللي احنا مفتقدينه في مصر. ما فيش work team. ما فيش. <تصفيق> طيب. We at Orthomedics can help in the following. Prevent a development of ulcer. ولو حصلت الالسر treatment of ulcer. Prevention of recurrence of ulcer. رابع حاجة treatment of شر. إيه اللي بيحصل؟ Also mechanics of diabetic food, poor blood supply, nerve damage, ligament laxity, excessive overload on the ligament and the muscles, كل ده هيأدي لإيه؟ lead to different foot problem. وطالما في foot problem يبقى في تحميل على أماكن أكتر من التاني. Example the biomechanical risk factors in overpronation. الويت بيرنج معظمه بيبقى ميديال على الهيل والهيد بتاع الفيرست متترسى البوم. انظر اكزامبل الهالوكس فالجس والبانيون انظر ريسك فاكتور الهامر توز الكالاس فورميشن شارب فوت الامبيوتيشن الأرثوتيك انترفينشن الكاستم ميد انسول سو الريدي ميد انسول نوت وورك ويز ديابيتيك بيشنت ثيرابيوتيك شوز سبليتس بروكر الكاستم ميد انسول سبيشالي ميد فور ايتش بيشنت اكوردنج تو ذا نيتشر اوف ذير بايوميكانكس ايه الفانكشن اوف كاستم ميد انسول أول حاجة redistribute the pressure correct the abnormal foot position compensate the leg length discrepancy ودي نقطة مهمة جدا about 80% عندهم shortening يبقى أنا لو عايز أعدل أو أمنع أو أعمل offloading أول حاجة لازم أعملها إن أنا أشوف هل في shortening ولا لأ وأعمل compensation في الإنسول. Another function of custom made insul is provide accommodation for the foot. Therapeutic shoes offer support and protection, reduce the risk of skin breakdown. The medical shoes used only for conservative treatment. بس اللي بيحصل حاليا إن كل حالات الألسر بتطلب لها medical shoes. Not recommended in diabetic foot ulcer. The splinters will work. Correct the ankle's instability, so it can mild or moderate or severe. We use the splint will work in the case of sharp foot. Orthopedic treatment program for diabetic feet. The program is very important. لو ركزنا فيه كويس وابتدينا نشتغل بيه كلنا المريض بنسبة 100% ان شاء الله هيكتب. اخترنا مجموعة الايديما والفوت سنسيشن والفوت ديفورمتي والانكل ستابيليتي والالسر والشاربو البارامتر دي 
على اساسها بنختار الاورثودكس اللي هنقدر نستخدمه مع المريض. ليفل 1 لو الايديما ما فيش ايديما ما في الفود سنسيشن جود الفود ديفورمتي ما فيش فود ديفورمتي الانكل ستابيلتي ستيبل ما فيش السر يستخدم النورمال شوز معاه كمان انسول سيليكون انسول بس الحاله دي اكشوالي مش موجوده ليفل 2 كل حاجه نورمال ما عدا فود ديفورمتي يس النورمال والديابيتك كل ايه يا دكتور؟ ال... لو انا عملت تشيك لحضراتكم كلنا هنطلع كلنا عندنا فود ديفورمتي بنسب مختلفه وجهاز الفود برينت موجود حضرتك بره في الستاند اللي شا... اللي يحب يعمل تشيك انا جاي مفيش حد نورمال يا دكتور مفيش حد مش ديابيتك يعني ديابيتك ومش ديابيتك معظمنا مش نورمال طيب تمام صح يا دكتور صح طيب ليفل 2 لو اي في لو في اي فود ديفورمتي في فلات فيت في فارس فيت في كلو 2 اي ديفورمتي زي دي بنعمل فوتو سكان ونستخدم الكاستم ميد انسول بس دي الستكنس بتاعها قليل عشان نعمل ريدستريبيوت للبريشر وبيستخدم الحذاء النورمال بتاعه العادي. ليفل 3 لو في ايديما وفي السنسيشن بور سنسيشن بالاضافه لان في فود ديفورمتي هنا طالما في ايديما ما ينفعش يستخدم ابدا الشوز النورمال بتاعه لابد يستخدم شوز طبي او ثيرابيوتك شوز يبقى عباره عن 3 بارتس بنقدر نوسع ونضيق ونعمل الانسول عن طريق جهاز الفوت برينت وبرضه ستيل السكنس بتاع الانسول بسيط ليفل 3 هنا في ايديما وفي بور سنسيشن وفي فوت ديفورمتي والانكل الانكل الاستابيلتي الانكل الاستابيلتي هنا مايلد ومودريت وسيفير لو هي مايلد انا هعمل فوتو سكان هعمل كاستم ميد انسول سكنس قليل واستخدم الانكل جيل او استخدم الشوز بس يكون ويل سبورتد من الميديال واللاترال ليفل 5 نفس المواصفات في ايديما وفي بور سنسيشن والفري فود ديفورمتي والانكل انستابيلتي هنا مودريت تو سيفير مفيش السر مفيش شاركو هنا عشان الانكل انستابيلتي مودريت تو سيفير لابد ان نستخدم الاير ووكر مع الانسول دخلنا في الالسر في ايديما وفي بور سنسيشن وفي فود ديفورمتي بالتاكيد وفي انكل استابيلتي انستيبل مودريت تو سيفير وفي السر هعمل فوتو سكان بس هنا هستخدم الانسول 3 لير والسكنس بتاع الانسول ديبند اون السايز اوف السر والسايت اوف السر والديبس اوف السر فممكن الانسول يبقى حجمها سنتي او اثنين او ثلاثه او اربعه اكوردنج البارامتر دي والحاله دي لابد استخدم معاها اللونج اير ووكر لان الانكل هنا انستيبل مودريت تو سيفير ليفل 7 في ايديما وفي بور سنسيشن وفي فود ديفورمتي وفي انكل انستابيلتي ومفيش السر بس في شاركو والشاركو هنا ليه مكانين مهمين بالنسبه لنا في الميتا تارسل وفي الهيل او الكالكينيا البون لو في في الميتا تارسل بنستخدم الشورت اير ووكر مع الانسول الشاشه حديث
boleh masuk tu, doktor. Mike please. Lala Mike ada doktor Ahmad. Ah, doktor Ahmad tu tu. Ada masalah lah, hulak syasha bas. Hidar di shway ya. Tuati من العرض اللي حضرتك عرضته ده مفيش عيان ديابيتك وهيمشي من غير انسول المفروض يعني اي عيان ديابيتك رايح رايح يشتري جزمه هنقول له يعدي على حضرتك الاول يحط انسول على حسب الليفل اوف ديفورمتي والبارامترز هيك اتكلمت عليها دي بالظبط يا دكتور صح كده؟ طيب هنكمل وبعدين يبقى في ديسكشن ماشي طيب احنا دلوقتي عندنا وصلنا للشرق شاركت في الميتا دارس البون هنستخدم الشورت اير ووكر يبقى الشورت اير ووكر هنا لان الشارك الشاركو في الميتا دارس البون لو الشاركو في الكالكينيا البون اتس مانداتوري تو يوز اللونج اير ووكر والاير كاست عشان انا عايز كومبليت فيكسيشن للفوت والانكل والليك عشان امنع الشيرينج فورس واعمل سبورت لو في السر وفي شاركو سواء كان في الميتا تارسل او في الكالكينيال انا مانداتوري استخدم اللونج اير ووكر مع الفوت برنت والفرشه اللي هي بتبقى 3 ليرز في بعض الحالات ممكن نستعمل لها حاجه اسمها الويتش هيلينج شوز الويتش هيلينج شوز ده مش بيبقى فيه تحميل على الميتا تارسل خالص او على الهيل هما نوعين بس ده ليه شروط لابد يكون الانكل ستيبل بنسبه 100% لان لو اي ديفورمتي حصلت هيقع طيب البيت سورس في جهاز الهيل اب ده ده حاجه سمبل كده عباره عن نوع من انواع السبرنج حاضر يا دكتور الويتش هيلنج شوز الصوره هي استاذنكم بس اجيب البوينتر ده ده تحفه يا دكتور ده افكتف بشكل آه اللي هو ده هنا التح مفيش تحميل خالص على منطقه الميتا تارسل وبالتالي في كومبليت اوف لودنج بنسبه كبيره جدا على آه مكان الفول فود اتفضل كويس هو السبب بتاع الالسر ده اللودنج عشان كده بنعمل اوف لودنج؟ آه. لا السبب بتاع الالسر ده الايتيولوجي بتاعه حاجه ثانيه خالص. ما احنا اتكلمنا على الباسو ميكانكس. على الايه؟ على الباسو ميكانكس في الاول اتفضل. ايه الفاسكولو ميكانكس؟ آه البور سيركيوليشن والنيرف دامج والليجمنت لاكستي والبريشر. لا في كمان البلاد كواليتي فاكتور الهيلنج فاكتورز الحته دي شايف اللي دي عبارة عن دي؟ مجموعة من الهيدرو ميتا تارسلز كلها ديسلوكيتد عشان كده عاملة بره بيسموها بريجنانت فور فوت تمام فدي مش هتهيل ابدا بالاوف لودنج الاوف لودنج هيمنع ان هي تزيد لغاية ما انفكشن يجي مرة ينيلها بس هيأخر شوية البروسيس انما مش هيمنع ولا هيخليها تهيل ابدا طيب لان هو الجلد بتاع ربنا اللي خلقه الاول خالص آه راح آه احنا مش هنقدر نعمل حاجه ثانيه الا لما نتدخل فيها دي ونصلحها الاوف لودنج هياجل بس ما هو انا انا من ضمن تيم فالدور اللي عليا الاوف لودنج مش اكتر من كده تمام لكن البيت الاستشاريتي هي مسؤول عنها ان هي تعمل الباقي اوكي تمام ما هو حضرتك اثرت قضيه مهمه جدا ان انا اشيل الليله كلها لوحدي لا اصل انا بقول لك ايه ما بقولكش عشان تشيلها اصل في اودينس لسه صغيرين شباب لما يشوفوا الالسر ده ويشوفوا دي وتقول ده سحر جميل بيعمل هيقول لك بس هي دي العلاج بتاع ده لا مع التيم وورك ايوه مع لكن انا مع كذا فاكتور تاني شكرا تمام طيب السر نوت هيل أو ألسر نوت هيلينج 
مين السبب؟ اورثومتكس صح كده؟ يعني نجيبها يمين نجيبها شمال هي اورثومتكس وانا موافق طيب insufficient circulation infection inadequate pressure relief moving to toilet without protection بعض المرضى بيعتقد ان هو بيلبس الووكر او الشوز وهو خارج بره البيت وده الاديوكيشن اللي المفروض كلنا نسعى ان احنا نوصل للمريض انه ممنوع يحط الارض رجليه على الارض تماما بدون الووكر او الشوز الموجود طيب الحاله دي وات از ذا بيست سوليوشن ده حاله عند في فيروس وفي السر وفي امبيوتيشن البيست سوليوشن هنا ايه والسيركيوليشن زي الفل الالسر دي هتهيل لو بالتيم اشتغل هتهيل بس يا دكتور بعد ما بتهيل بترجع ايه تاني ومين الغلطان ورسو منكم اه طبعا طيب هو ده بيست سوليوشن للحاله دي تمام دي حالة عندها سوبينيشن سيفير سيفير سوبينيشن في السر دي احنا في الاورثوتكس والبروستكس بيهمنا الكواليتي اوف لايف دي افضل حالة ليها اعتقد الامبيوتيشن شاركو جوينت تريتمنت نون ويت بيرنج فور 12 ويكس بيشنت ايديوكيشن از كريتيكال اكس رايز مولد شوز اور سبلنتس احنا بنعمل ايه في اورثومينكس بنعمل كاستم ميت انسول هنا ولو مفيش ديفورمتي بنستخدم الاير ووكر او لو في ديفورمتي سيفير بنعمل كاستم ميت سبلنت بروستيك سوليوشن لو مفيش كده ووصلنا لمرحله البتر طيب اتفضل في هي كل حاله حسب الحاله كومبليت فلودنج في 100% بس ما عرضتهاش اللي هو الاوفلودنج بريس بحيث ان هو يبقى في تح... عايز عايز حد يمشي عايز الوكر مع الانسول ده يديني من 70 ل 80% 70 ل 80% لكن لو انا عايز كومبليت اني ووكر بقى اللونج اير ووكر بالانسول مع بعض هو الدكتور احنا بنعمل الاوفلودنج ازاي؟ بنعمل البايوميكانكس بتاع الانكل بنعمل البايوميكانكس بتاع الفوت كويس؟ بنعمل الشورتنج لو في شورتنج ونعمل انسول عشان ريديستربيوت البريشر ونعمل اوفلودنج على الجرح اربع حاجات الاربعه لو اتعملوا صح اعتقد باذن الله مع العلاج بروستيك سوليوشن هي اورثوميدكس وكيل آه سوري انا عايز اشغل الفيديو بعد اذنكم شباب حد يشغل الفيديو احنا وكيل شركه اسمها آه اوتوبوك وكيل شركه جديده خاصه بالاوستيو انتجريشن ما عادش فيه سكت بيعملوا بليتس بيثبتوها داخل العظم من جوه بيطلع منها بنز بيركب فيه الجهاز هنوري لحضراتكم فيديو سو طيب واحنا اب تو ديت تكنولوجي في البروسيسز احنا اوتوبوك سي ليج الجينيوم احدث حاجه بالاضافه للجديد اللي هو الاوسيو انتجريشن كان في فيديو خاص بال بال بقصه الاوسيو انتجريشن ومعانا النهارده اللي رائد البطل احمد عبد اللطيف احمد جه اتفضل اه ثواني احمد اتفضل معانا ده آه بنتكلم على الجينيوم اكس 3 بنقول له دو وات يو وونت تو دو
ماشي ماشي مش فاهم انت يا ابني مصنوع من ايه؟ فانا خدت المثل اللي بيقول لك عشان تطلع قدام قوي لازم بترجع فانا قلت الاصابه دي حاجه هترجعك وهي فعلا رجعتني بس بعد ما رجعت انا طلعت اقوى من الاول الراي احمد هو سفير شركه اورثومتكس اي مريض محتاج تاهيل نفسي او ياخد فكره عن الاطراف الصناعيه ويعرف ان في امل باذن الله احمد بيه معانا في شركه اورثومتكس بيقدم نفسه مساء الخير انا نقيب احمد عبد اللطيف بريف سريع عني عشان الفيديو كان فيه حاجات كتير مش جايه انا قبل ما اتصاب كنت بطل عالم كون وفو سافرت منتخب مصر سافرت ليبيا وتونس والصين وكنت بكسب بطولات الحمد لله لحد ما دخلت الكليه الحربيه وانا في الكليه الحربيه ربنا كرمني ودخلت صعقه آه وانا في الصعقه آه كان في ميشن في سينا واتصبت في سينا آه بعدين موضوع الاصابه ده بيعمل ستوب ان انت بطل عالم وفي الجيش فطبيعي ان اي حد بيحصل له حاجه انا او غيري آه لما اكون حياته ماشيه نورمال وفجاه يحصل ستوب ان فقط حاجه من جسمه الموضوع بيبقى شبه مستحيل ان انت تفكر انك ترجع تاني. بدات اخش على النت وانا في المستشفى بعد عمليه البتر ادور ايه اللي انا هقدر اركبه في رجلي طرف صناعي علشان ابدا ارجع لحياتي الطبيعيه او شبه حياتي الطبيعيه. طبعا ما كنتش متوقع اللي انا فيه دلوقتي بس ساعتها كنت عايز مجرد ان انا ارجع امشي مش مجرد ان انا اتحرك او حاجه انا عايز اتمرن وعايز 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 وعايز. ساعتها دخلت على السوشيال ميديا كان ساعتها شركه اوتو بوك في مصر مع دكتوره ثانيه وكانت هي المسؤوله عن حالتي وفي المستشفى عشان انا كان في شظايا كتير في العظم وكان في انفكشن فهم شالوا العظم اللي كان موجود ومفصل الحوض. ففي مصر معظم الدكاتره بتاعت البروسيسز ومعظمهم بتوع العظام قالوا لي بدل ما فيش عظم انت مستحيل تركب طرف صناعي. كانت دي فيها مشكله الحمد لله بفضل ربنا وفضل دكتوره تانية كان في امل ان شركه اوتو بوك هي اللي هتعمل سوكت مختلف لحالتي. الموضوع كان شبه مستحيل لحد ما الحمد لله بعد فتره بدات اخد اول خطوه. اول خطوه دي طبعا اكن بيبي لسه اتعلم اول خطوه فكانت فرحه كبيره جدا ومن هنا بدات ان انا ابدا اخد الخطوات الثانيه. الحمد لله بعد الاصابه على طول ركبت طرف صناعي سافرت بطوله عالم تاني وكسبت تاني ورجعت اتكرمت بسياده الرئيس في تحسيسي تاني الحمد لله بعد الاصابه لحد ما دخلت في المجال وبدات اتعلم وافهم بعديها شركه اوتو بوك انسحب الاسم وبقى مع شركه اورسو ميدكس رحت شركه اورسو ميدكس علشان انا بقابل مشكله كبيره جدا في مصر ان الصيانه بتاعت جينيوم لازم يسافر المانيا فما كانت يعني كل سنه كان لازم يسافر المانيا فبقعد شهر او شهرين من غيره لحد ما طبعا اورسو ميدكس بقت هي الوكيل فده وفر عليا كتير وده بقى احسن لي فرحت اشوف اورسو ميدكس حقيقي ما كنتش اعرفها لان كانت اوتو بوكس ساعتها هي البوب في المجال لما رحت شركه اورسو ميدكس متوقعها شركه عاديه بصراحه دي كلمه حق لما قالوا لي روح المصنع لقيت حاجه ثانيه خالص هم بيصنعوا كل حاجه بيعملوا كل حاجه كل حاجه بالمقاس كل حاجه الراجل عايزها كل حاجه للبيشنت اللي بيروح بيلاقي لها حل أه لما سالت على على البراندات الثانيه احنا طبعا زي ما في اوتو بوك في اربع خمس براندات كمان برضو لقيت هم وكلاء ليهم فبدا يوفر ان انت ممكن تاخد السوكت من شركه والركبة من شركه والفوت من شركه فده نادر جدا لما تليف اي شركه ثانيه خصوصا لما تكون شركه معتمده أه انا سعيد ان انا موجود النهارده دي حاجه سريعه وسعيد طبعا ان انا مع دكتور خالد أه ان انا موجود في شركه اورس ميديكس ولو حد عايز يسالني سؤال انا تحت امرك. ايوه اتفضل شكرا دكتور انا عايز انا عايز اقول لك انا عايز اقول لك بس ان انا شخصيا والكل لي الشرف العظيم ان يقف قدامك ويشوفك ربنا يعزك دي حقيقه يعني ربنا يعزك انت فعلا مثل اعلى للانسان اكثر من الشباب انت فديت المصريين كلهم بحاجه غاليه عندك قوي والاحسن من كده انك بقيت اقوى من الاول واحسن من الاول وربنا يكرمك ونشوف كل المصريين في شهامتك ورجولتك وقوتك متشكر جدا شكرا
شكرا دكتور خالد ربنا يحفظك من فضل حضرتك لو كان ناو اوبن ديسكشن اتفضل خلاص اتفضل شكرا دكتور خالد انا بس ليا ثلاث نقاط حقيقه لاحظتهم هنا اول واحده متعلقة بال بال بالبلاد سبلاي هو حضرتك لما وديت لنا الصورة ودايما ده بيحصل كتير جدا في كل حتة حقيقة بيبصوا للقدم كده ويقولوا لا ده جود دي جود بلاد سبلاي لا في في الدايابيتيك بيشنت الموضوع مختلف لأن المشكلة ما هياش في الافيلابيلتي اوف ذا بلاد يعني أحيانا إحنا بنلاقي في الفيسل البلاد موجود والسيجنال كويسه جدا وممكن تحس البلس ويبقى فول باوندنج بلس. المشكله في اليوتيلايزيشن اوف ذيس بلاد ده العوامل كتيره خالص ما فيش وقت نذكرها لكن هو البلاد موجود لكن التيشو مش قادره تستخدمه. فاحنا ما يصحش ان احنا ما نقول نشوف الشكل دوت الاحمر ده نقول ان ده جود بلاد سبلاي. لا المشكله في الدايبيتك بيشن ستيل الرجل دي معرضه في اي واحد دي نمره واحد. نمره اثنين ان عيان الدايبيتك هو بيتحول لحالة بالذات في اللونج ستاندنج دايبيتيس إلى حالة بنسميها سكندري هيموفيليك بيشنت يعني عنده السرمبوزس أسرع من أي حد من من الواحد العادي وبالذات في السمول فيسل في الكابيلاري بيت بتاع الفوت فده معرض في أي وقت رغم إن جوت بلاد سبلاي يحصل سرمبوزس ويحصل حتى جنجرين وبيتميز الدايابيتس انه بيبقى فوق الجنجرين كمان يعني ما ياخدش كل الرجل ولا كل اللمب فيعني هي دي حاجه مهمه الحاجه الثانيه ان البايو ميكانيك بتاع الفوت والديسفانكشن بتاع الليجمنت دائما ما بياخدش مكان واحد وهي دي معضله كبيره جدا لما نيجي نتعامل معاها لان احنا لما بنصلح حتى وضع وهو كل الاوضاع كلها ديسفانكشن فدي المشكله لدرجه ان حتى الالسر نفسيها لما انت بتعمل حضرتك بتشيل البريشر من عليها في المكان بتاع الالسر احنا بننقل البريشر في مكان ثاني وهي دي المشكله الكبيره جدا يعني لان المكان مش 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 خاص مكان ريجن واحده والمشكله طبعا الدكتور محمد الشرقاوي يعني مشكورا التعليق بتاعه ان دان من الالسر ما هياش بس البريشر الالسر تحتيها انفكتد بون اوسوميليتيك انفكشن مشاكل كثيره جدا هي اللي بتساعد في البيزنس بتاع الالسر يعني ده كله لابد يعني يتاخد منها لكن شكرا على البرزنتيشن هو ده اللي نفسي فيه يا دكتور الحالات الانديكيتد فور امبيوتيشن امبيوتيشن يعني لو حاله وصلت لمرحله سيفير لان احنا ساعات كتير جدا بيجي لنا حالات مش عارفين نعمل معاها ايه كان القصد من المحاضره النهارده ان انا يعني احنا جزء من منظومه المفروض دورنا نساعد هو ده المهم بقى عشان كده انا بتكلم يعني بص يعني عشان الجينيور يعني هي الموضوع منظومه بيحتاج تيم كبير جدا وبعدين اكتر من كده هو نفس التيم ده مش بيشوف المريض مره واحده ده المفروض يتابع المريض لايف لاستنج يعني هي دي المشكله فحتى المشكله اللي بتحصل يعني احيانا التيم ده بيعمل شغل كويس قوي العيان وبعد العيان يروح يمشي يختفي طب وبعدين هتبص تلاقي المشكله دي اتكررت ان شاء الله احنا في الاي بي سي باذن الله مستشفى جراحه الاي دي في اسكندريه هنبتدي سيمينار شهري ونجيب فيه اصعب الحالات ونتجمع كتيم ونشوف لها ونتفق على القرار ايه بالنسبه لها يلا ربنا ان شاء الله احنا في القاهره باذن الله ربنا يعين <تصفيق> شكرا شكرا دكتور خالد <تصفيق> في اي حاجه ثانيه يا جماعه احنا هن دكتور هاني اتفضل دكتور هشام بشكرك بعد دكتور هشام بقى هنقفل السيشن عشان في ان شاء الله الغداء دكتور احمد عايز طيب يعني بعد دكتور هشام ان شاء الله هنقفل السيشن عشان في الغداء بقى ان شاء الله ونكمل بعدين ان شاء الله بشكرك دكتور خالد واسره اورس ميديكس على ال... انتوا بتحاولوا تقدموا سيرفيس للمريض كامله من التريننج وال واختيار الشوز المناسب بالبيدو سكان شفت الحاجات الجديده اللي بتقيس البريشر اريا والحياة بس هي في نقطه في مريض السكر ان هو الووند تشارجنج ووند اللي هو بيحتاج يتعمل له دريسنج عايزه برضو يبتاخد السكنس بتاع الدريسنج ده عشان اما اعمل الانسول 
ابقى عامل حساب ان المريض هيبوظ الاوفلودنج تاني يعني لما بيجي يحط دريسنج والسكنس بتاعه يبقى عالي هو ضيع الجزء اللي انت عامل له اوفلودنج وبالتالي الريكرنس طبعا بنتكلم على تايب اوف ارسر اللي هو انا متاكد ان هو نوروباتيك ارسر وكلين ما فيش فيه انفكشن ما فيش فيه يعني العيان مشكلته الهيلينج وما فيش اذر واي ان اعملها له لان هقدر اعمل له ارثوديزيس ولا هقدر اعمل له اي حاجه ثانيه فهو الاوفلودنج هو يعتبر الحاجه الوحيده بالنسبه له مع طبعا تصليح الجنرال كونديشن والديابيتيك ستيت والحاجات الثانيه اللي هي الميديكال دي لكن ستيل ما زال في بريشر اريا المريض بيتعامل معاها غلط اللي هي حته الدريسنج وان هو يحط فوم او يحط حاجه ثانيه مع الاوفلودنج فدي عايزه برضو الانستراكشنز للبيشنت وان انت تدي حتى لل تمريض السكنس اللي هو المطلوب يتحط في كل دريسنج عشان استفيد من الاوفلودنج اللي انت بتكون عامله هو يعني الدريسنج اعتقد هيبقى اكوردنج السايز والبوزيشن والديبس فدي عمليه كومبليكيتد لكن طبعا هو لو لو اتفقنا ان المريض يزور الشركه كل اسبوعين مره هقدر اعمل موديفيكيشن على الانسول بس البيهيفير بتاعه المرضى هنا في مصر للاسف يعني بس انا اتمنى ان مع كل دريسنج يشرفني في الشركه واعمل له موديفيكيشن على الفرشه بحيث ان انا اعمل حساب الدريسنج لان التحكم في حجم الدريسنج اعتقد مش سهل صح يا دكتور؟ اه بالظبط بالظبط يعني لكن انتوا عاملين اورينتيشن لحاجه زي كده يعني احنا جاهزين آه. بس السكنس كل مره بيجي لنا في ساعات بحس ان السكنس بتاع الدريسنج بيبقى ريسك فاكتور على ان الالسر وهو بيدوس يفتح اكتر بالظبط هو بس عشان الدايبيتيك بيشنت ده كاتيجري اوف بيشنت مختلف تماما عن التروماتيك يعني الكابتن صح. احمد يعني ربنا يحفظه بصراحه مثال اللي قدر يتغلب بانه عمل تريننج طبعا ده خد منه مجهود ضخم جدا والجزء اللي هو اتشال ده يعني برضو انا امبريزد ان هو قدر الحمد لله يقدر برجل واحده قدر يحرك عضلاته ويقدر يعني فده يعني مثال جيد جدا جدا ممتاز ليه البوست اورثوديسيس اللي اتعمل بالنسبه له يعني احمد بي هيبس ارتيكيوليشن حاله صعبه آه جدا أنا جدا أنا جدا جدا يعني ده ربنا بس هو بطل وهو انسان جميل ولا زال بطل يعني يعني ما شاء الله عليه يعني صوره مشرفه للي قدر بالاراده وان ما فيش حاجه ممكن تبقى بعيده طالما في اراده وفي ايمان ربنا يحفظك شكرا 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 Thank you, Dr. Khaled. And now, uh, half an hour for lunch. Thank you.
مكاسب بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا من غير خوف 
بتقولها في ثانية ناس لو قالت ما تخبيش من غير خوف بتقولها في ثانية مدد يا شيخ زي الدرويش مدد يا شيخ زي الدرويش انه عشان الناس التانية هي رشدي ولا زيزنيا اسكندرية ناس بتعيش وكأنها مش في الدنيا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم at the start I welcome everybody that Uh, come today for our meeting, the seventh edition of ABC Meet. Uh, we really greatly appreciate your efforts and time. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, hoping that you uh, enjoy our uh, uh, settings and uh, enjoy our scientific content uh, and get benefit for all of this scientific content. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> On behalf of the vascular surgeon of Alexandria, I have the honor for, to welcome you all from Egypt, Middle East, Europe, and America. It's my great honor to have this gathering in Alexandria to continue this journey that we started over 30 years ago, aiming to gather professional vascular surgeons from around the world to spread scientific knowledge that give the next generation of surgeons the opportunity to adopt the most modern technique to help our patients. I would like to offer my gratitude to the president of this meeting, Professor Wael Shalem, head of the Department of Vascular Surgery at Alexandria University and vice president of Alexandria Vascular Hospital and his colleagues to have continued to make this event of the most superior quality years after year. My gratitude also, also extend to all the pharmaceutical companies that, supposed, that supported this meeting. Without them, we would not have had the opportunity to gather here today. Finally, I give my appreciation to the group of ICOM under the leadership of Dr. Ahmad Shell. Thank you to everyone on the team who did not hesitate to make this gathering as great as possible. I hope you enjoy your meeting, discussion, scientific dialogue, and accommodation. Bismillah uh, uh, I will not talk much. Uh, we are already running late. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, stand here today, and I can't believe myself. It's been two years since last meeting. Uh, we had the honor to, to run the, uh, the last international meeting in Egypt, because after uh, one week after that, uh, the COVID era started, and I'm uh, very pleased and glad to um, recontinue this activity again with you. And I hope we, we never stop it, and I, we all pray that we never see this era again. Um, uh, I welcome all of you, and I'm pleased to, uh, to have all my professors standing uh, beside uh, us and uh, at our back today. And I, I de deeply apologize for everyone who tried to contact us during the last week, uh, and we couldn't accommodate him. Uh, and because we were surprised from the immense number of uh, junior staff uh, who uh, were eager to, to join us uh, this year. Um, I will leave the uh, talk for uh, Dr. Ahmed Asim to give you a brief um, uh, presentation about the workshops we are doing uh, this year, and then we'll start our uh, session straightforward. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's a pleasure to stand here among you all. Um, I'm Ahmed Asim. Uh, I was in charge of the workshop uh, agenda, and um, it feels like home having a, a conference back again and the gathering and all the uh, nice uh, opportunity to meet everybody. 
Uh, actually, in AVC1, I was a fresh graduate with a small talk, and I was so nervous I'm coming here to, to give a talk. And now here in AVC7, uh, I'm among the organizing committee. Uh, thank you all for giving me the, uh, the, the chance to do so. Uh, this year, we, had, we have workshops. We have uh, actually directed the workshops towards our younger colleagues. So basically, we're talking about basic life support. We're talking about basics of EVAR. We're talking about basics of uh, uh, static uh, venous work and laser and stuff. We have basic vascular anastomosis. So um, I hope everybody enjoys his day and enjoys our content. And um, nice to see you all. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. May I ask uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Taha to call for the next session? Thank you. Professor Dr. Rafat Naga and his excellent team for organizing this excellent meeting. And I would now call for uh, my co chairman, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmad Naga, Professor Dr. Ala Abdel Halim, uh, Professor Dr. Samir Qusayr to chair with me this session. Uh, and this is, session is about uh, peripheral arterial disease. And uh, we are running out of time, and we have to, uh, I would ask all the speakers to stick to time. And uh, after taking the permission of uh, the president of the meeting to, uh, to make the discussion at the end of the session, is okay? The whole discussion will... Okay, so it's not allowed. <laughs> All right, uh, first... All right. So uh, after the end of each talk, we will allow only one uh, question because we are late about uh, 48 minutes. The, uh, now I'm going to call the first speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Sharawi. Uh, Dr. Sharawi is the uh, chairman uh, of uh, Vascular, ex chairman of Vascular Surgery at Cairo University, and uh, he's going to talk about a common a missing limb salvage criterion a case presentation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> it's my honor to be here with you. Uh, many thanks to Professor Dr. Uh, Rafat Naga, uh, Wael, Sha'la, Wael uh, Sha'lan, and also Ahmad Naga for inviting me for the organizing committee and scientific committee. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here is the disclosure. I'm supposed to be the chairman of MENA region, which means the Middle East and North Africa for the Food International Organization and the International Working Group of Diabetes. This is the case report, which is a common missing limb saving criterion. Seventy-two years old male patient, diabetic, presented with dragon green in the distal phalanx third and fourth left toe, clinically minimal infection at their toes. This is the picture of the patient. I asked it for laser printer, I think this one. Yes. Okay. According to our color-coded protocol, which is published in Journal of Diabetes Investigations, we do investigation according to this protocol. We found that there are four keys are missing. Blood quality, which is the blue. Bone factor, the yellow. Blood quantity, the red. And tissue loss, the black. We start with the blood quality factor correction. We found only that the hemoglobin is 8%, which is when calculated by the hematocrete, 21% reached six gram, which is unacceptable for any healing of a wound. Others are okay. Plain X-ray showed 
osteomyelitis of the distal phalanx of the attack of the third and fourth also, and the blood examination, blood quantity examination by duplex and arteriogram proved that there is ischemia. We did arteriogram during the endovascular intervention. There is infrapopletial arterial disease, and the three vessels are occluded when, and uh, is not reaching the foot. We did PTA, even with two millimeter balloon, we could reach the arch, and we could establish the arch of the foot. I asked my assistant to do immediately the brightment of these two toes. But the relative of the patient, after I left, they asked him, okay, there are pedal pulses now, no need to rush, just wait. Maybe we will not need this. And unfortunately, he accepted. <clears throat> 12 hours post successful revascularization with pedal pulse, the patient was presented with this picture, which is an emergency. And the TLC jumped from 9,000 to 18, creatinine to 1.9, serum albumin dropped to 2.5, and the random blood sugar raised. Also, if you can see this, this is compartmental syndrome from occlusion of the veins in the compartment, and gangrene is going to be established in this muscle compartment. This is an emergency. So we were pushed in the second day to do debridement and evacuation of the space, the compartment, and then to put the suction back to help early uh, healing. My recommendation to dear junior vascular surgeon in diabetic limb salvage are number A, before revascularization. Now remember that there are four other important factors that might need correction first to save the limb. According to our published study, over 1,500 cases, one speciality-minded management will lead to 100% limb loss. Two speciality-minded management will lead to 80% limb loss. Our published protocol of management, which considered all the etiological key for each lesion, will lead to... One minute, please. Make it one second. It's not working. It's not working. Our protocol lead to 89% salvage of default lesion and 72 salvage for cases presented for major amputation. B, after successful revascularization, please don't leave the patient after successful limb revascularization because infection will flourish, septicemia in our septic shock will arrive, and you will see your patient in the ICU, and you will do the major amputation with intact pedal pulses to save the life if possible. Recommendation also is don't title the patient with your respected specialty. Invest in brain, regular education orientation seminar to patients, organize systemic education to nurses, creation of diabetic food salvage fellowship program. Diabetic food salvage should be a specialty with syndicate. مش شغال الكمبيوتر لسه شوية على بال ما يشتغل يا جماعة الأورجانيزرز ده كده بتعطلوا أكتر يا ابني وان مينيت مور من فضل دا 
diabetic food patient deserve the best treatment you can do. This is wrong statement. Diabetic food patient deserve the best that should be done. Don't limit diabetic food salvage to your limited personal or speciality ability. This is the Diabetic Food Salvage International uh, Diabetic Food Salvage Fellowship, which is done in Chennai in India. It's WHO accredited, accredited from Madras University, and first part from Cairo University. It's done three times till now. This is the examination in clinical. Anybody can apply for the fellowship program every six months by sending to this email or WhatsApp to this number. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sharawi, for your presentation. And uh, the floor uh, is open for a single question. Any question from the floor? Single or married? Please. <clears throat> Mike. Thank you, Professor Sharkov, for this uh, nice presentation about diabetic food. And I know well uh, you have an experience uh, in management of diabetic food. Uh, but my question for the amputation, immediate amputation, or you will wait for uh, uh, 72 hours for revascularization of the food when there is dry gangrene. This is a debate for immediate okay. amputation or leave when there is no infection. This dry gangrene with line of separation. Okay. The point is you have after successful revascularization, don't feel that you are a hero, you got epidal pulses, and this is finished. No, the minimal infection will flourish, so you have to do debridement immediately. This does not mean amputation. Debridement means drainage to the infection. If there is gangrenous tools, you have to do localized amputation. That's all. If you wait, this infection will spread and will make the compartmental syndrome, and if you wait, you will have to do baloney amputation or major amputation to save the life of the patient with intact pedal pulses. Uh, I know, but i asking for, there is parameters for immediate amputation. If there is elevation of the uh, TLC, if the patient is feverish, if there is pointing point, but if the patient is calm and uh, uh, just trophic changes or ischemic ulcer, uh, uh, the papers are recommending for to wait for revascularization for, uh, for uh, I got your saving, question saving uh, the food I got your question the... I got your question you are asking about an ulcer I'm speaking about infection in toes in a patient with gangrene with minimal infection after revascularization this will flourish but the ulcer is something else okay. having an ulcer this is something else okay thank you uh, now, um, thank you for Professor Sharia. We move forwards uh, and now call for the next speaker, uh, Professor Mohammed Al Kasabi. Uh, Dr. Al Kasabi is talking from Ireland and he's going to talk about uh, stubborn patient and stubborn disease. Dr. Al Kasabi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be presenting a story about a long battle with a stubborn disease and a stubborn patient this time. So our patient is a 76 years old gentleman who worked as a farmer. He's an ex-smoker. He's diabetic, hypertensive, with ischemic heart disease. He has history of cardiac bypass surgery for three vessel disease in 2011. And he suffers from congestive heart failure with poor ejection fraction and severe aortic stenosis. Over the time, he developed chronic renal failure and he was on hemodialysis when I met him. His initial presentation to the department was in 2010, where he presented with left foot uh, infection and non-healing ulcer. He underwent SFA angioplasty and transmitted tarsal amputation at that stage. He represents to the department again in 2021. That's when I met him, when he had um, right fifth toe gangrene. Uh, his angiogram shows a significant disease of his femoral popliteal segment with heavy calcification. He undergoes 
plain old balloon angioplasty for his um, SFA disease, which has good results. And as you could see from the images, he had reasonable tibial vessel outflow at that stage. He um, goes also for a fifth toe amputation, and he was discharged home. But unfortunately, he comes back with another ulcer on the fourth toe a couple of months later only. And his um, toe pressure has significant drop. His angiogram shows a worsening of his tibial disease at this stage with total occlusion of a long segment of his anterior tibial artery. Um, again, this was successfully treated with a uh, blain balloon. The story doesn't end and he comes back also a couple of months later with um, spreading of infection from that ulcer into the forefoot. Uh, at that stage, we try to revascularize the foot and we successfully go into the pedal arch through the dorsalis pedis artery and we've got good results. He undergoes amputation of his second, third and fourth toe at that stage. Our patient is unfortunately a very stubborn patient. He does not stay in the hospital for more than a couple of days. He's not compliant with dressing and he's not compliant with his diabetic treatment. Um, he barely attends his dialysis sessions. So he comes back again with another ulcer on the knuckle of his uh, right hallux, which is complicated with osteomyelitis. His CT angiogram shows patent vessels, but with uh, multiple significant stenotic lesions with very heavily calcified plaques. So at that stage, we decide that the only um, left attempt is to go with an atherectomy device and try and debulk these heavily calcified plaques. We go with the um, jet stream device and we do this debulking of his SFA segment. And we also do angioplasty of his uh, tibial vessels at that stage. Why did we go for uh, debulking with the atherectomy device? Because atherectomy is a very good tool for preparing the vessel for angioplasty. Obviously, it removes the shelves and the uh, heavily calcified lesions, allowing for a good expansion of the vessel with the uh, balloon angioplasty. It's also very good for treatment of free stenosis lesions, as shown in the uh, multiple publications. And it's also very good in uh, removing the heavily calcified plaques, which prevents delivery of a uh, drug when using drug-coated balloon, which we used in this case. Atherectomy is very good for uh, also very long occlusions in the femoral popliteal segment, but it can also be used for uh, tibial occlusions. And it gives very good results, uh, specifically for heavily calcified lesions. It has also very good results for treatment of instant restenosis. There are many atherectomy devices available in the market, but in our uh, department, we opt for the jet stream device, mainly because of its front cutting mechanism. Uh, the jet stream has two uh, positions for the blades, which allows for change of the diameter that is required for debulking. The jet stream also has an aspiration mechanism which allows for removal of the debris during uh, atherectomy. Uh, this also allows for treatment of small amount of thrombus that might be present in cases of acute and chronic occlusions. And uh, it also allows for uh, treatment of these vessels without the need for distal protection. Um, jet stream also has a differential cutting mechanism which uh, allows for debulking of heavily calcified lesions without injury to the elastic normal tissue. Atherectomy devices and jet stream must be avoided in these situations. First, when we have a subintimal passage of the wire for fear of perforation of the vessel, and also when we have a single outflow vessel because damage to this vessel uh, with debris will lead to compromise of the only hope for future bypasses. Uh, they also shouldn't be used in a heavy load fresh thrombus for fear of trash of the foot, and they shouldn't be used in high grade stent fracture for fear of uh, damage to the vessel uh, through interaction with the struts of the broken stent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kasabi, for your presentation and for second time. Uh, question from the floor. Okay. Dr. Hashem. Uh, 
thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, your nice presentation. I asked for the using of uh, atherectomy devices for uh, total occlusion. Is uh, some tips, tips and tricks you mentioned in the uh, in, in the in your end presentation uh, for fearing of perforation of the vessel, but I think the uh, mainstay to pass the wire through the lesion. You can't do this. Uh, you can't use the atherectomy devices without passing the wire, and you are sure that you are in the true lumen. Sometimes. Uh, uh, using in total occlusion without passing of the wire, it is harmful for the vessel and uh, ending by uh, 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 destruction of the intima. And so uh, uh, your recommendation for passing of the wire, or you can using it uh, as uh, 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 passing uh, for total occlusion. Good evening, Professor Hashem. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, no, the, the attitude here in the department is that if we fail to pass uh, intraluminally, we don't use atherectomy for fear of uh, perforation. Uh, we use only the jet stream, again, because it's forward cutting rather than a side cutting atherectomy. And um, it doesn't need much direction as long as you feel that the wire has passed without making a loop and went uh, transluminal then things seem to be very straightforward. And of course, you start with the blades down uh, and you make your way and then you um, use the blades up afterwards after you create some uh, tunnel in the beginning. Uh, okay, Dr. Kasser, question from the panel. Thank you for the nice presentation. My question, do we have a strong evidence that a theoretically really make a difference because all the trials which they compared recorded balloon versus recorded balloon plus a theoretically showed no significant difference. So do we have really a strong evidence because the cost is high and we're adding a lot of cost. So does it really worth it? Do we have any strong evidence? We know the concept is correct, but the problem we need an evidence. So I, I, I believe the numbers are very low to uh, provide a level one or two even evidence uh, for the use of atherectomy device. And it's, uh, as uh, you know, Professor Sar, it's, it's nearly impossible to have similar patients to compare the results uh, when you look at these kind of uh, cohort of patients. Um, in this gentleman, because he's a renal failure patient and diabetic, so he had very low, very high load of uh, calcification in his lesions. And uh, as you said, it felt that it made sense to use these um, kind of devices in this situation. We don't use them routinely. We don't use them uh, just because we have them and we don't use them in uh, any kind of short lesions, um, even of their total occlusion. Um, we kind of uh, use them very, very selectively. Um, and I think that makes sense. And as people keep uh, doing that and keep using them in a very limited situation, I think the evidence will be very slim for using them again because of numbers and smaller series. Thank you again, Dr. Kasabi, and we move forwards. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Amr Omran. He's going to talk from Germany. Uh, Dr. Amr is going to talk about hybrid conversion of task D SFA lesion into task A. Dr. Omran. Uh, uh, my uh, subject today is a hybrid conversion of task D SFA lesion into task A, uh, A lesion. So uh, we have two cases uh, I'm going to present. The first case concerning a uh, male patient aged uh, 50 years old. He is presented with PED stage 3 Lorish and Fontaine uh, right lower limb. He underwent in 2018 uh, superficial femoral artery thromboendartrectomy. Uh, uh, a common femoral artery thromboendartrectomy with pericardial patch. Uh, we did also anti-grade ring stripper endartrectomy of the superficial femoral artery. There was no intimal flap, there was no stent, was inserted. This patient has a risk factor. He has right bronchial non-small cell uh, carcinoma, suspicion of metastasis. The, this patient, we did CT angiogram for him, and uh, the, here CT uh, shows uh, it's a 27 centimeter complete occlusion of the SFA. He has also he had also infrapopliteal lesion. Uh, here, the uh, I showed you here CT in cross-sectional area just to show you the soft thrombus. 
uh, and uh, 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 almost no calcification of superficial femoral artery. So uh, we decided in this patient to do uh, a thromboembolectomy of the entire superficial femoral artery, but the technique we used is Fogarty over the wire technique. So we inserted the wire first, then guided uh, the Fogarty caster on top of the wire uh, with the aim to remove, uh, and we succeeded to remove the old atherosclerotic embolus. Then we did intraoperative angiogram, which showed the residual stenosis. It was tusk SFA lesion, and we could uh, dilate it, at, and we inserted stent. The, the balloon was 8 millimeter, uh, 6 centimeter uh, lens, and the stent was 8 millimeter and 4 centimeter lens. Then we uh, dilated the posterior tibial artery and the fibular artery uh, after this. This is uh, the picture, and here this is the neck of the residual stenosis at the junction between SFA and the popliteal artery segment one. And this is the control angiogram. The uh, case two, uh, this male patient who was 51 years old, he, he was presented with PED, uh, three Lurish and Fontaine, uh, right leg. He has he had this uh, with CT angiogram complete occlusion of the SFA with a lens uh, more than 25 centimeter atherosclerotic occlusion, and he has had meanwhile a uh, popliteal artery aneurysm, 1.5 centimeter in diameter, but with huge mural thrombus with risk high risk of embolization. He still has uh, patent three leg arteries. His great saphenous vein was less than two millimeter and was not optimal for infragenicular uh, bypass. Uh, this is the CT angiogram, uh, coronal section showing the uh, 25 centimeter complete occlusion. And this is uh, the aneurysm, uh, which shows also the lumen and the huge intramural thrombus. And this is popliteal vein beside. So uh, again, I, uh, I, I put this CT cross-sectional to uh, just show you the soft thrombus with minimally calcified SFA. This give, give us the courage also to improve the inflow for the further appropriate aneurysm artery repair. So we did for this patient, uh, at, uh, first we did uh, through uh, thromboendarterectomy with a common femoral trifurcation with pericardial patchoplasty. We did thromboembolectomy of the entire superficial femoral artery with the technique Fogarty over the wire technique. We removed all the old atherosclerotic embolus. We did intraoperative angiogram and then the PTA and the stenting of the residual stenosis. One month later, we did a short saphenous vein interposition of the popliteal artery after improvement and after gaining uh, inf good inflow for the popliteal aneurysm repair. So this is the interoperative uh, pictures, and here this is the neck again of the residual stenosis, dilatation, and distenting. Uh, here this M MRA uh, control, uh, three months later after popliteal aneurysm repair was interposition graft short saphenous vein and after stenting uh, of the SFA. So this is just a reminder of TASC-A and TASC-D lesion of SFA lesion. So TASC-A lesion, this single stenosis less than 10 centimeter in length, or the single occlusion less than 5 centimeter in length. And the TASC-D lesion it denotes SFA occlusion more than 20, 20 centimeter. So my message uh, from this or conclusion, conversion of TASC-D to TASC-A in SFA lesion is worthwhile to try according to CT finding of soft thrombus was done or scarcely calcified SFA Especially, uh, uh, especially with the regular wall, use of Fogarty over the wire technique to avoid intimal flap and dissection under fluoroscopic control in a hybrid theater. Successful result helps to shorten. Just Successful result helps to shorten the operation time and decrease the inter and operative burden on the patient. Very useful in high risk patient and when the great saphenous vein is not optimal for a long below knee bypass. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Question from the floor. I, I just would like to understand your message very well, Dr. Amr. Uh, do you mean that uh, you are extracting uh, a, a chronic uh, atherosclerotic lesion from the SFA by Fogarty? Uh, uh, the pathology is usually, uh, usually at the junction between SF and popliteal artery, there is a, a atherosclerotic plaque and, and soft thrombus built it beyond this plaque okay. in the most of the cases. So, how to get to, how to go to this thrombus with a Fogarty uh, through an occlu a chronic occlusion by atherosclerosis? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, my aim was to remove this soft thrombus uh, above the level of this atherosclerotic lesion. So now we can convert the, because we can manipulate it as a task D, and then this way we can stent all the SFA. 
Okay, but in this way, if I put short stint, this increases the permeability or the patency uh, the, in the long time. And this popliteal aneurysm, for example, this patient has pathology, the second patient has two pathology, has uh, uh, complete SF occlusion and has popliteal aneurysm. And the great softness was less than two millimeter. So we have no choice. So we... we, no, we no, no, what, what about the, the option of lytic therapy here? Thrombolytic therapy? Yes. So uh, it is, was not a uh, short, uh, I mean, uh, well, thrombolytic therapy usually we use uh, if we did stenting and the patient came after stenting with intrastent thrombosis. So usually we use uh, thrombolysis. But in such case, we, we, uh, we, we treated that as an old lesion. Okay, please. Okay. Question, please. Thank you. Um, I'm very confused by your second case. Why would you treat a 1.5 centimeter popliteal aneurysm? And if you're going to, if you're worried about thrombus and embolizing, I would just anticoagulate the patient rather than reopening it, uh, unless the patient has signs of ischemia. Okay, this is a good question. Uh, usually, we uh, we investigate all patients with doublex, which is a, also an advantage in Germany. So, uh, as I saw the aneurysm in, in uh, doublex ultra shell, it gives me more panoramic view. So uh, I could uh, uh, see a uh, huge intramural thrombus, a uh, soft thrombus, uh, uh, what was uh, echo, echo arm uh, thrombus with high risk of embolization. This is why we decided to enter, uh, uh, treat this aneurysm with interposition graft. Thank you very much, Dr. Amr. Uh, now we move forward, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammed Smail. Uh, Dr. Mohammed is going to uh, give us a talk uh, entitled Angiojet Thrombectomy uh, for Acute Limb Ischemia. Dr. Mohammed. Okay, due to Okay, due to a technical uh, problem, there's going to be, uh, they're going to fix it soon. We move for the next speaker, uh, Dr. Hani Shinawi. Dr. Hani is going to talk about vascular emergency in a COVID-19 patient. Thank you, uh, dear chairman. Uh, we are facing uh, many and hundred uh, cases of uh, uh, thrombosis a vascular emergency in the last two years, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, and we present, <clears throat> and now we present uh, one of these challenging cases. Uh, vascular emergency in COVID-19 patient case presentation. Uh, the challenge in this case is not in the technical, uh, in the surgical technical uh, uh, procedure, but in the uh, 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 decision making. Uh, a case of acute bilateral lower limb ischemia in a 31 years old female patient with COVID-19, mitral valve replacement, oral anticoagulant Marivan, INR 2.2, uh, recent cardiac arrest with, with CPR, and on uh, noradrenaline. In this situation, uh, this is the presentation. Uh, there is no uh, femoral pulse uh, bilaterally and coldness of the uh, foot and leg, and this is uh, this cyanosis of tooth. Uh, Doblex ultrasound uh, revealed uh, chronic, uh, uh, revealed uh, total occlusion of uh, both uh, uh, iliac uh, we does not, uh, uh, did not uh, wait for uh, CT angio. We take the patient to the uh, OR. Uh, we cut down of the common, right common femoral. Uh, diagnostic angiography reveal uh, uh, total uh, occlusion of the right common and external iliac artery and total occlusion of the left uh, uh, external iliac artery. Uh, Thrombectomy was done uh, bilaterally.
This is the bilateral thrombus. This is the uh, immediate end result. This is uh, uh, the result after one week, no uh, tissue loss. Uh, we are uh, le uh, learned from uh, COVID-19 in the last two years many, many uh, lessons. Some lessons uh, learned from COVID-19. Acute limb ischemia more typically affects patients with severe COVID-19 occurring five to seven days after respiratory decompensation. About 20% of the patients who present with acute limb ischemia, related acute limb ischemia, have few or no respiratory symptoms. Uh, furthermore, acute limb ischemia can occur during the recovery phase following infection of any severity. Thrombosis of large or medium-sized arteries have all been reported. I'm sorry. A small vessel uh, thrombosis leading to digital gangrene is often associated with administration of vasopressor agents. Thrombosis of prevascular reconstruction, including stent and bypass graft, can also occur. The diagnosis of acute limb ischemia is predominantly clinical, but we uh, do, can do vascular imaging, duplex ultrasound, computed tomography, and geography. To, look, to confirm the location and the extent of the arterial obstruction. The selection of vascular imaging studies uh, in patients with COVID-19 associated acute limb ischemia may be the, uh, dedicated by availability of resources and the stability of the patient to undergo the study. It is important to consider the severity uh, of the uh, systemic illness when considering whether to perform the inter an intervention patient with COVID-19. Uh, many patients with severe respiratory manifestations are not candidate for limb salvage. Uh, despite attempts at revascularization, acute limb ischemia associated. Uh, one minute, please. Uh, has high mortality and a high rate of limb loss. Uh, major amputation below knee or above knee is required in up to a third of the patients. Uh, following successful intervention of acute limb ischemia, patients with COVID-19 are maintained on therapeutic anticoagulation and transition to oral anticoagulation like uh, warfarin or duwax or low molecular weight heparin with or without addition of antiplatelets to uh, reduce incidence of recurrent ischemic events. Let me to thank my uh, uh, team in facing of this uh, high uh, challenging case. And thanks for all the uh, doctors all, uh, all over the world for facing this pandemic in the last two years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haney, for nice case. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what's your explanation of having a thrombus uh, resting in the common iliac artery in spite of a patent totally uh, totally patent uh, arterial tree from its distal end down to the tibial vessels, down to the dorsalis pizza and sur tibial without any culprit region. What mechanism that causes this thrombus to rest upwards in the common uh, iliac artery? Do you have an explanation for this? I think the patient uh, uh, before uh, this thrombosis uh, 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 has any uh, cardiac arrest and severe hypotension, uh, and may the, the, be the cause of uh, thrombosis in this area. I, I ask, I'm asking this question because this might be ex, uh, uh, understandable in a patient with embolic ischemia at size of bifurcation. Yes. But for a thrombus, there must be a culvert region arresting this thrombus in, in, certain, situ uh, in certain positions. D didn't you think of having uh, a completion geography after the, the procedure? Uh, we have a uh, beetle pulse uh, after uh, this compilation of sure. uh, thrombectomy. Question from the floor. Okay, Dr. Raad. Thank you, Dr. Hani. Uh, in which way you link between this acute thrombosis and COVID-19? I mean, yani, how to be sure yeah. yani, about yeah. this link is the, is the cause of COVID-19, is the cause of this uh, uh, I think in the last three years, uh, any patient who come with uh, 
uh, thrombosis like that in, uh, and uh, has infection of COVID-19 already, I, I think this is the cause of uh, thrombosis, I think. I think this I mean, need more investigation I mean, to, to make this, uh, such link. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Can I answer? I think this is the same question is that what we found, because we have a lot of cases of uh, COVID-19, the problem was this patient, first, they have no risk factor. They're young patients. And then with the thrombosis and high risk of limb, uh, limb uh, amputation. So I think the main issue is the intimal damage. I think the COVID-19, it causes intimal damage, inflammation. That's why you get a thrombosis. The reason why you finish, even you get combustion angiogram is perfect, they re-thrombose. And the reason why they end with, uh, with, with amputations. So I think the main issue is uh, intimal damage flow by COVID-19 virus. Okay, but what, yani, my question is, how to be sure that the intimal, this intimal damage is linked with COVID-19? Well, there's many, many studies look at that, and even when the pulmonary issues, they found this is because of, not because of the lung, it's because the capillary is being damaged by the COVID and caused thrombosis, the reason why they have respiratory issues, you know? So it's kind of like an AV shunting can happen with them. That is why it gives them high percentage of oxygen, and still you cannot saturate them because an AV shunt. So I think the main issue with, with, with COVID-19 is a vascular issue, really. It's not a respiratory issue, because the damage only has happened at the level of the intima, and cause inflammation and thrombosis. And okay. otherwise, they get an MI, they get a stroke, they get uh, pulmonary manifestation. So I think the main, main issue is, is, is vascular. Yes, really. it's based on only observation at Osamir. And I do agree with you that the, the, the number of cases of COVID-19 yani, ha, had uh, thrombosis somewhere in the body. But my question is, we are not sure so far this issue yeah, and you need some investigation just to know the uh, actual mechanism also. Thanks. Uh, are, are we ready for uh, Mohamed Ismail, or uh, shall we go on for the last presentation? Audiovisual, please. Are we ready for Dr. Mohamed Ismail? Okay. Back to Dr. Mohamed Ismail, uh, uh, professor of vascular surgery at Hin Shams University of Egypt. Uh, Dr. Mohamed is going to talk about angiojet from back to me for acute limb ischemia. Dr. Mohamed. Dr. Ahmed, uh, I would thank the distinguished panel and dear professor and colleagues. Uh, I have a chance in such uh, a valuable and successful meeting to uh, discuss about the role of angiojet thrombectomy device in vascular surgery practice in the new era of uh, non uh, of many, many invasive uh, procedures in vascular surgery. Uh, what you, we need in the uh, 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 the device of the uh, angiojet, we have some potential benefits using angiojet thrombectomy, including rapid removal of thrombus, quick restoration of blood flow and resolution of symptoms. The control system is automated and step-by-step -step interface by procedure efficiency and self-configuration to each catheter uh, is uh, done and it's have highly mobile console. Uh, what is the uh, mechanism of action of the catheter? They have a powerful and controlled mechanism of action for large and small thrombus burden, mainly the power pulse lytic delivery. Uh, it's available in the family of peripheral catheters of the power uh, pulse delivery enables lytic delivery for thrombus treatment and deliver medication like uh, uh, actylase directly into the clot where it's most effective and saturating and softening the tough thrombus to facilitate the removal. Also, the saline jet travel backwards within the catheter at high speed, creating a powerful vacuum effect. The cross-stream flow is especially designed to optimize the thrombus removal, and the thrombus is drawn into catheter where it is fragmented and evacuated into, from the body into uh, the console. With peripheral arterial thrombus, every minute counts. So with the 30 days mortality rate, it's 15%, uh, and the 30-day amputation, 25%. Acute limb ischemia is critical condition, but by with angiojet, with or without 
uh, power pulse offer a quick restoration of flow and resolution of symptoms in acute limb ischemia and allow of a quick treatment of acute and intra procedure uh, thromboembolic complication also and may reduce the need of prolonged lytic therapy and procedure time leading to potential cost benefit and less complication. So the uh, recent pearl uh, registry data showed that immediate improvement in 93% of arterial vessels treated and 90% of limb salvage rate of patients presenting with threatened limbs at this line was treated by angiogenic. So critical only ischemia uh, thrombectomy is uh, by the angiogenic have a beneficial uh, condition in uh, amp lessening the, uh, the amputation rates uh, and discharge from the hospital and lower the hospital stay. So, like we see, it's 89% limb salvage rate in a year, and 80% of the procedure was completed in less than 24 hours. So, 56% of patients was treated only in single session. So what is the peer registry? It was two phases established in the procedure to document the procedure and patient outcome in the vascular treatment of arterial, venous, and AV shunt sites using the angiogenic catheter system. It was included in 952 patients. The pearl one followed the patient for three months and pearl two for 12 months after angiogenic thrombectomy. So like we see in the, the, the table, the total lytic uh, uh, amount by alteplase is uh, less when we use angiogenic only, and even when we use combined lytic therapy by angiogenic and catheter directed therapy is less than uh, using the lytic delivered by catheter directed thrombolysis only. So lower the rate of complication. Let we see uh, our cases today. This is our case. This was pre-operative uh, angiogram. This was male patient, 58 years, smoker, diabetic, and history of claudication, suddenly complaining from pain, impaired movement, rubber, cyanosis of the tooth. So the, our management was going to make an uh, endovascular uh, thromboly uh, uh, thrombolysis by mechanical thrombolysis by angiogenic pulse spray and clot suction and balloon angioplasty was done and this was the final result. Case two is uh, for male patient. This is CT angiography preoperative. It's a 36 years male, history of bypass for popliteal aneurysm five years ago. He has bilateral surgery for popliteal aneurysm. Uh, so this, uh, uh, sorry, 30, 30 seconds. Uh, have a surgery for popliteal aneurysm five years ago and developed collocation pain two weeks pre the presentation and then presented to us with sudden acute pain and coldness of the limb. This was a preoperative uh, angiogram, and we tried to pass the, the bypass and started with the uh, angiogenic. This is after first result, after first session, second session, still there is a, a defects of thrombus, and this third with injection distally of uh, lytic therapy and keep the patient of anticoagulation and the patient under follow up now for, I think, seven months is till now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Mohammed. A uh, question from the floor. Dr. Ali Badr, uh, Do you use uh, lytic therapy, thrombolysis, yeah. only thrombolysis? Only thrombolysis, yes. What's the place of thrombolysis, only thrombolysis, without uh, angiogenic? Yes, I use catheter directed thrombolysis okay. in arterial or venous uh, patients. Uh, in the arterial system, if it's acute phase, I use catheter directed thrombolysis passing through the arterial system and make an uh, infusion of uh, lytic therapy after pulse spray uh, or pulse injection uh, all over 15 millimeter, uh, milliliter of. Uh, okay, anglis. okay, I know the protocol. What's the benefit of Anjujet? What's the benefit of Anjujet to lower the hospital stay, less lower the cost of uh, ICU admission, lower the complication? It it render us to make the the procedure only in one session. I think it uh, will uh, have an just uh, one hour. I 
make an, uh, let even I, if I use the power pulse, I use the power pulse for uh, just 15 minutes and wait for 30 minutes, then go what? to the sessions of the, uh, of the uh, license by the NJET. Okay. So it's a shorter hospital stay, shorter stay in the ICU with less complication uh, uh, because I use a very little amount of the uh, thrombolytic uh, okay. vial. It's the cost of NJET in Egypt. 2,000 euro? In, uh, in Egypt, it's 30,000. 30, uh, in, 30, in, in France, 2,000 euro. It's Dr. 30, Ali, it's we, 30, we, we have a lot of money, don't worry. No, no, it's 30,000, 32,000. After, after the session, after this, because we are running out of time, the problem, sorry. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Ismail. Uh, now we move forwards. Uh, our last speaker is Dr. David Shaw from the United Kingdom. Dr. Shaw is going to talk about endovascular treatment of extremely calcified SV occlusion. Please. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you very much for my um, invitation to this meeting. Did I just press the down button? So, yeah. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist, I'm afraid, rather than a vascular surgeon, but my case is a 78-year-old male who has the normal um, history of uh, our patients who had a previous proximal um, intervention and a left-sided fempot bypass and presents us with this ulcer. The presentation actually came within the first wave of COVID, so the hospitals weren't working normally, so he didn't have his normal risk scoring or toe pressure performed. He had an MRA, which demonstrated that the inflow was fine. He had a fairly long SFA occlusion with a diseased P1, P2 segment and single vessel runoff on that right leg by the perineal artery. Uh, because there was limited access to theater, and also I, you noted he had a history of varicose veins, so there was no venous conduit, uh, it was suggested that he go for an endovascular solution to this. Uh, and a colleague of mine took this on, where he um, obviously did an anti-grade puncture, demonstrated that there was this reasonably long SFA occlusion, but what the MR doesn't show is that there's a heavily calcified uh, SFA, which was extremely difficult to pass. He failed to pass anti-gradely, and then attempted some retrograde access. What I would note here is that he has two attempts, and um, I'm afraid the equipment he's using and the, the site of access is highly inappropriate. So after that failure, he came back for a repeat attempt uh, the same week, and unfortunately, he developed some fresh thrombus in that proximal SFA. So we abandoned that, and he returned one month later. But as you can see, within that month, he'd had a significant clinical de deterioration. Uh, obviously, uh, that area had now occluded. He had to have contralateral access. Again, we um, attempted an anti-grade crossing. You can see that the... Uh, it's definitely subintimal. We're outside the line of the vessel, uh, and uh, I failed to get across antigradely as predicted. So this time, using the appropriate equipment, which is the Cook micro access device, using an 018 wire into a vessel with a good lumen, i.e., below the knee, uh, I managed to get the wire access, and then using the sort of adjunctive techniques to get in through and through wire position. Uh, you have to realize that these procedures are long, they can take two or three hours, you need multiple wires, and obviously the right support catheter and balloons. Uh, he was predilated, very calcified lesion, so I placed a superior scaffold. And what was very unusual, despite adequate predilatation of that area and post-dilatation, he ended up with this focal uh, stenosis in the, in the, S, in the, the adductor canal at the SFA stem, which I've never seen in a superior before, even after uh, uh, even after post-deployment angioplasty, which I don't normally do. And so I was faced with having to place a short balloon-mounted stent at this segment, which, of course, is not really um, uh, advised as uh, it, it could get crushed. But I thought it was low risk in this because superiors have a, a very high resistive force in there, so it's probably protected. Um, just to show you the outcome, he obviously healed his ulcer but had a small breakdown 12 months later and came back for a repeat angiogram which showed some mild instant stenosis at the top end. Uh, but actually, the area of interest had remained patent without any problem. 
So my take-home message really are twofold. One is that um, it's important. These difficult these lesions are difficult to treat, but they are possible. But it's important to know the right techniques and, and the equipment that's available to you, uh, because you know if you delay, you can see that they clinically deteriorate very rapidly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw, for an excellent case. My question is. Don't you uh, consider any kind of drug loading technology in such heavily calcified lesions? Um, so I, I would do. Uh, well, I, I, I have a view that the superior has excellent um, uh, patency uh, equivalent to drug eluting stents. In fact, what I didn't, because of the time limits, I didn't tell you is that uh, because it's a full length uh, occlusion and it's difficult to. to um, predict where the top end of a superior stent lies, the, the second stent in the upper half of the SFA is actually a drug-eluting self-expanding stent. But that is the stent that, current, that had instant stenosis afterwards. But I find from the, from the evidence, the, the superior stent seems to have a very similar primary patency to a drug-eluting stent. And in, this, and in this case, with the heavy calcification, I don't think any other stent would have kept the lumen open. Thank you very much. So, uh, question from the floor. If so, so we... Uh, uh, Dr. Oksamer. Uh, thank you, David, for a nice uh, case. Uh, we do the same. We try anti-grade. If we cannot, we go retrograde. But before we go retrograde, we try re-entry devices. Do you have any experience? Yes, I, I, I use re-entry re devices moderately regularly. What I find is that um, with the retrograde access, uh, um, when I measured it, I only use re-entry devices in about 1% of cases, but I would use uh, retrograde access probably in up to sort of 35% now. Um, in this case, um, I was trying to keep the lesion as short as possible, so I wanted entry into that popliteal artery, rather the occlusion as short as possible. So re-entry into that very disease segment I didn't think was possible. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shaw, for your uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, by this presentation, we close our session uh, of this afternoon. And uh, now I call the chairpersons of uh, the next symposium, uh, Dr. Ahmed Osman and Dr. Nagib Al-Askari. Nagib Al-Askari and Ahmed Osman.